Welcome to the first inaugural episode of Your Turn to Roll Presents Descent into Avernus, an actual play Dungeons & Dragons production inspired by the Baldur's Gate Descent into Avernus and Chains of Asmodeus pre-written campaigns. Before we dive in, it's important to acknowledge that I do not own the intellectual property of either campaign, and I encourage you to support the official release. A bit of housekeeping before we begin. This episode is coming to you in post-production due to a bit of a rookie error on my part. I forgot to record my microphone during the live session. Because of this oversight, you might notice a difference in audio quality between myself and the players. Additionally, there may be moments where the dialogue seems disconnected. Despite these challenges, I've opted to record my part after the fact to preserve the original flow and spirit of our game. Re-recording the entire episode would not only compromise the authenticity of our play, but would detract from the genuine enjoyment and reactions of our players. With that in mind, please enjoy Your Turn to Roll Presents Descent into Avernus. We're thrilled to have you along and to share the journey through dungeons, dragons, and the depths of the infernal realms. Before we fully immerse ourselves in the hells of Bator, let's take a moment to discuss the unique lens through which we'll be experiencing this Dungeons and Dragons adventure. Picture a vibrant amalgamation of campy cartoons and adorable chibi animations, where the darker and more adult themes of violence, sexuality, and vices are approached with a disarmingly whimsical touch. This blend of styles serves not just as an aesthetic choice, but as a narrative tool that allows us to explore complex themes in a way that's engaging, thought-provoking, and above all, entertaining. As your dungeon master, I will often narrate scenes by describing what we see. This technique is akin to setting the stage in a theater production where the description is intended for you, the audience, to visualize the scene and feel immersed in the world we're creating together. However, it's crucial for our players to navigate this information carefully. The details I provide are often meant to establish the atmosphere and context of the scene rather than to serve as direct cues for character action. Players are encouraged to act as though their characters are unaware of this audience level information unless it's explicitly made available to them through gameplay. This approach ensures a rich layered storytelling experience where the line between audience and actor blends, and every discovery remains as thrilling for the characters as it is for those of us watching their journey unfold. This narrative style not only enhances the immersive quality of our adventure, but also encourages creative thinking and role-playing among our players. By separating character knowledge from audience insight, we create a dynamic storytelling environment where surprises await at every turn, and the unfolding drama is as unpredictable to the inhabitants of our story as it is to those of us on the outside looking in. With this understanding, let's dive into the world of Descent into Avernus. Prepare to embrace the unexpected, revel in the whimsical, and enjoy an adventure where the fantastical meets the formidable, all wrapped in a narrative style that hopes to delight and surprise. As the dawn breaks over the Sword Coast, a panorama of conflict and legacy unfolds beneath the watchful gaze of an unseen observer. The camera sweeps across the land where shadows stretch long and deep, weaving through the cities and countryside alike, a silent testament to the turmoil that grips the forgotten realms. It is a world of contrasts, where the light of heroism battles the encroaching darkness of ambition and despair. Descending into the heart of this maelstrom, we find Baldur's Gate, a city born from the ashes of treachery and bloodshed. Its founders, Pirates who danced with death set the tone for a city where every shadow could conceal a dagger, every alliance a potential betrayal. Yet, amidst the chaos and danger that pulse through its streets like the lifeblood of the city itself, there thrives a vibrant testament to the resilience of its people. Against the backdrop of Baldur's Gate's infamous history, 
a solitary figure makes her way through a bustling street. She's a woman on a quest, not for gold or glory, but for a connection lost to time and shadow. In her hand, she carries a coin of golden Baldurian make, its edge inscribed with a message that spirals to infinity. Truths conceal secrets, reveal truths, conceal secrets, reveal. This cyclical enigma, a beacon from her sister Marvine, guides her steps through the city's labyrinthine paths. Meanwhile, fate's threads weave tightly around another soul, a tiefling awaiting in the secrecy of a secluded alleyway. This meeting, orchestrated by Marvine, a figure enshrouded in the city's whispered legends of crime and cunning, promises to unite two disparate halves of a story yet untold. The camera, ever watchful, pans out to frame the stark juxtaposition between Baldur's Gate and the distant Elturel, where Baldur's Gate is a testament to the human ambition and frailty, Elturel stands as a beacon of divine grace, its people living under the celestial glow of the Companion, yet as refugees whisper of unspeakable calamity, the narrative weaves a complex tapestry of light and dark, of cities and souls caught in the inexorable pull of destiny. The stage upon which our story unfolds, a tale of individuals bound by blood, honor, and the search for truth amidst a realm where every secret unveiled could alter the course of history. In their hands, the fate of the Sword Coast may well rest a delicate balance of power in a world where the light of heroism battles the encroaching shadows of ambition and despair. As the tale unfurls across the canvas of Baldur's Gate, our focus narrows to a singular moment of anticipation. Through the tangled web of alleyways, our intrepid seeker, guided by the enigmatic message encircling her golden coin, turns a corner with the hope of reunion burning bright within her heart. Yet, expectation veers into the unexpected as she finds not the familiar face of kinship, but the enigmatic gaze of a green tiefling waiting in the dim light. The air, thick with the tension of unspoken stories and the electric buzz of potential alliances, holds still for a mere heartbeat. This tiefling, Standing with an air of anticipation and the confidence of someone well acquainted with the city's darker underbelly, was prepared for this very moment. Marvine's description were meticulous, painting the image of an armored paragon of good, a beacon of righteousness in a city that often blurs the lines between moral shades. Now, the lens shifts, and I'd like to invite Fierce Witchling into the director's chair. Why don't you describe for us what the audience would see from Deanne's perspective as she comes into this meeting place, seeing Morrigan there. Describe Morrigan, her look, her attitude, everything about Morrigan's appearance in this situation. Walking into the space, Morgan would look, I would look, a little shifty. She's not, um, she's not as familiar with being in places she doesn't know, but she is wary of people not liking the way that she looks. Um, she's a tea frame. She's usually a little dirty. Mostly just from all the time that she's traveled. And the person that she's looking for, she doesn't really know if they're friends. <laughs> so in that way, we're looking around. She looks a little shifty, but also like she's not. Okay, yeah, that's great. In the dim light of the secluded alleyway, a moment of truth unfurls as Deanne rounds the corner. Her heart set on the reunion with Marvine, her sister, whose guidance had led her here through cryptic messages and enigmatic inscription on a coin, yet what awaits her is not the familial embrace she had envisioned, but the striking figure of Morrigan, a green tiefling. Wait, is it Deanne or Diane? What? Which one? Uh, Deanne. Diane is my mother. No, I did not do that intentionally. (laughs) (laughs) 
I did not I did not know what I was doing until after it had been done. Oh man, do I have a book you should read? Uh, it's about this guy named Oedipus. It's, it's great. Oh god, I know exactly how that story goes. <laughs> okay, well similar to how I had Morgan describe what Deanne sees, I'd like you to take a moment to describe how the audience sees Deanne through Morgan's eyes. Uh, so for Deanne, you see a slightly above average, not tall, but, you know, little tall for a girl, a woman, clad in full chain mail. She is on alert. She is scanning her surroundings. You know, she's heard enough stories about these clandestine meetings going wrong. Uh, she has short brown hair, a very intense, focused look on her face. She's on a mission. And she also has these sort of dull golden eyes that, you know, that's not entirely normal for a human, but at the same time, magic exists in this world. There's a number of explanations. But it wasn't just these two that Marvine worked so hard to put together. As it was when Marvine reached out to Zaheer, Zaheer was not really into turning down free money, especially for something as simple as go observe a meeting and make sure these two people don't kill each other. Zaheer had really no real reason to say no, so he was waiting at this location, and I would like you to describe possibly hidden off in the, the distance or possibly standing boldly uh, in front of everyone, uh, how does how does Zaheer look in this sort of overcasty morning uh, it, it, meeting between these two these two people. You'd see some large hairy creature trying to shade his sight using the sun so that anybody who would be looking his way wouldn't necessarily be able to look directly towards him because of the bright sun. And he would be scanning the perimeter. Um, you'd see a large sword in his hand with a shield ready to be pulled out and he's intently looking between the two meeting in front of him great thank you so as we the audience see these three kind of standing apart from each other uh each in their own corner in this own very narrow location uh, i i want to i actually want to turn it over to the three of you uh and and you can paint a picture for us as to how your meeting would go. None of you really expected the meeting to go exactly like this, but I want to give you just a moment to really paint the scene for us. What does it look like when you come together? You each know a little bit about your past, but truly your chance to paint the whole picture here. Hi. <laughs> um, it's kind of weird seeing both here, I think, uh, for Zaheer, I was, I don't, I don't even know if you remember me, I, you look a little different than when I last knew you. I look a little bit different. Look at you. A lot happens when, I don't know, a decade has passed, I guess. More than that, but yes. Good to know that you can tell the time. I had to learn how to use my fingers. Yeah. How so? And, and at this point, he realizes that he's been talking and that he wasn't hiding like he thought he was. He's like, mm -hmm. oh. <laughs> you, did you ever think that you can hide? You're not very short. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> And Diane, you kind of look like your sister. Yeah, most people don't pick up on that um, because of the whole devil kin, I suppose. Mm -hmm. But uh, few people notice that we have our mother's eyes, and she kind of raises up her hand to vaguely gesture up its, you know, the eyes, like I mentioned. Yeah, they're a little unique. Your sister never is. I don't think she really talked about you to me that often, but she did mention the eyes thing. I am I admit that I'm surprised she gave you well her name, my name. Usually she doesn't 
Usually she has quite a few names, but uh, never her name, I guess you could say. I know a lot of things. Morgan <laughs> Hawk, she, uh, in general, she surprisingly knows a lot of things for someone coming off as not. She was, she was always good at figuring things out. I could never quite figure out how she did it, but well, she always loved those stories of spies and danger a bit more than me. I was more, uh, nice. If you would prefer to be dramatic. Yeah. Your eyes look like your sister, but I don't really know if you act like Before we turn our gaze to the shadow-draped alleyways where our adventurers stand at a crossroads of destiny, let's trace the threads of fate that have drawn them to this moment. Our story unfolds in the bustling heart of Baldur's Gate, a city teetering on the edge of darkness, where the actions of a few are about to ripple through the lives of many. Marvine, a character we've heard about, a figure shrouded in the intrigue that blankets the city finds herself ensnared in a web spun from the darkest corners of Baldur's Gate. Her discovery? A noble family, veiled in secrecy, whose machinations threatened the precarious balance of power within the city walls. This revelation, dangerous and potent, could unravel the delicate tapestry of alliances and rivalries that keep the city's heart beating amidst chaos. Recognizing the gravity of her findings, Marvine sets a plan in motion, a plan that requires a player untouched by the corruption seeping through the city's cobblestones. That player is none other than Diane, her sister, summoned to Baldur's Gate by a message cryptic yet urgent, inscribed upon a Baldurian coin, truths reveal, secrets conceal. The message runs in a loop around its edge, a cycle of words that draws Diane into the fray, her presence in the city now a beacon for what is yet to come. Enter Morrigan, a figure with her own dance amidst the shadows, yet bound to Marvine by threads of loyalty and shared secrets. Instructed to await Deanne's arrival, Morgan is a key piece in Marvine's strategy, her role to guide and, if necessary, shield her from the dangers that lurk within Baldur's embrace. But Marvine's warning echoes through the plan. Trust no Baldurian. The conspiracy they're entangled in runs deeper than the city's oldest foundations, and allies are a luxury they cannot afford without caution. Amidst this tangled skein of alliances and secrets, fate introduces an unexpected element, Zaheer. Known to Morrigan from days long past, his presence in the city is no coincidence. A former military man with ties to the dark history that haunts Morrigan, Zaheer embodies the complexity of Baldur's Gate. Neither friend nor foe, his allegiance is a puzzle piece yet to find its place. Together, these three souls, Morrigan, guided by Marvine's cryptic missives, Deanne, drawn by the bond of blood and mystery, and Zaheer, a wild card cast by fate's own hand, find themselves converging in a moment fraught with tension and uncertainty. This is the how of their gathering, a confluence of paths, each shadowed by the past and illuminated by the faintest glimmers of hope. As they stand in the secluded alleyway, the weight of Marvine's unseen influence pressing upon them, the stage is set for a meeting that could alter the course of their journey. Here, in the heart of Baldur's Gate, amidst whispers of treachery and the promise of unraveling mysteries, our adventures face the dawning of an epic tale. The lens of our tale shifts, pulling back from the murk and mystery of Baldur's Gate, beyond the vigilant guards at its gates, beyond the stalwart fortifications of a flaming fist, tracing a path eastward. It sweeps across the landscape, leaving the brooding storm clouds and jagged coastline far behind, venturing into realms less shadowed, yet heavy with their own tales of sorrow and loss. As our view retreats, it catches the sight of two figures on horseback, their armor glinting in the weak sun, banners fluttering, a beacon of hope amidst despair. These are the Hell Riders, their standards bearing the mark of Helm, a gauntlet clasped in a defiant gesture of protection, encircled by the flame of vigilance, a sword and spear crossed in silent oath beneath. The camera's haste slows, drawn to the sight of a procession vast and varied, a river of humanity flowing through the landscape. This throng, hundreds strong, carries the weight of untold stories, Farmers clutching the hands of their children, 
Urchins with their carts bereft of goods. Messengers whose tidings have turned to ash. They are the survivors from the outskirts of Elturel. Those spared the city's dire fate. Now seeking the sanctuary within Baldur's Gate's daunting walls. Led by the Hellriders, guardians of Elturel, their march is a testament to resilience, a silent pledge to endure. Amongst this mosaic of the displaced, the camera finds its focus drawn irresistibly to a figure who moves with a grace that belies the grim march. Dancing with a lightness that contrasts sharply with the weary steps of the refugees, she moves through the crowd, her movements a melody made visible. With each twirl and a leap, her shamisen sings, a thread of beauty woven through the tapestry of their collective sorrow. As the camera narrows its gaze on Rose, it's clear why she captivates our attention amidst the multitude. In her dance, in her music, lies the heart of this journey, a testament to the enduring spirit of those who walk the path from despair towards hope. With the Hell Riders at their lead and Rose among their number, this caravan of souls moves ever onwards to Baldur's Gate and towards an uncertain future. Emerald, why don't you describe what we the audience see as Rose moves in and out of these refugees? Yeah. So you see this really elegant warforged um, with this fragile, delicate porcelain shell um, across her face are these cracks that seem to have been sealed with gold. Um, and she wears this really elegant pink kimono with a few roses on it and one rose matching in her hair that looks as flowing with life as she seems to be as she's running through the crowd. Um, she occasionally stops to a person that looks tired and checks in on them asking like, are you okay? Do you need me to carry you? Um, are your legs giving out? Just something to offer any sort of assistance. This next character we could all be forgiven for missing, as unlike Rose, they are doing their best to not be seen. They are a bit shorter, they have a cloak, they try to hunch over to minimize their visibility, possibly trying to pass themselves off as an elderly or a child, just doing the absolute- Girl, why are you so short? Yeah. Oh, sorry, my bad, I, I thought that, you know what, it doesn't matter, he can be tall, uh, short, medium height, average, I, it's up to you. I mean, I thought he was average, but you know, whatever. Okay, okay, yeah, so our, our, our average height cloaked, uh, uh, hidden individual, why don't you describe a little bit about Kid in this procession? Bro knows how to march, you know, that I'm kind of proud of him for that. Um, bro, bro's just probably just trying to blend in. Okay, yeah, so the camera picks up on some stuff. We, the audience, see things that possibly the others in the, the march don't notice. Uh, there are a pair of horns coming out of the top of his head, different from tiefling horns, but similar in a way. Uh, he has a cloven foot with hair that runs all the way down the thigh into the calf. Uh, there are just certain things about him that that betray an otherworldliness about him. He could possibly be satyr-like from the Feywild, or he could... It's almost... It's almost too um, hostile to be satyr, though his personality is very friendly, it appears like his looks are uh, betraying him to be some kind of uh, malevolent force almost. Again, only to the audience, not to the people in the procession. The next character that we see that the camera pans to in the procession is one that is kind of neither helpfully joyful like Rose, nor avoiding and withdrawn like Kid. This one is more taking in everything as an exciting, beautiful, wonderful new experience, talking to people about how their day was, talking to people about what their job is, talking to anybody and everybody about anything that they're willing to share, no matter how mundane it seems to them, this character seems absolutely enthralled. Can you tell us a little bit about Jacques Thibault? Paint a picture for us, tell us what he's what he carries himself like, what he looks like, what he's thinking. Just introduce us to Jacques. Yeah. Um, so, like, I think you painted this perfectly. Everyone's just like, I think it's just me and Rose just like bouncing around trying to keep hopes up, except Rose is more like the optimistic, kind of like trying to help people feel better. Jacques is, is this, this, this humanoid kid with like this jet black hair, kind of greasy. Um, He's, he's listening to this mechanical teddy bear kind of talking to it, um, whispering to it, not making much known. But 
obviously jumping around different people, learning as much as he can about these different people, seemingly um, unaware of who he's with, um, kind of just jumping around. Uh, what are you? Who are you from? Uh, where are you from? Who are you? Uh, you know, just asking all kinds of questions. Um, this kind of glimmer in his eyes is always apparent. He seems to be always wearing a smile. Great. So as these three, plus the hundreds of others that are marching in this, not really marching, traveling in this this group of refugees from the fallen city of El Terrell, uh, which the fate, I think, is unknown to most of the folks in this party. Uh, not just this party, but the whole group of refugees, as some were saying things like, yeah, we went into the city, uh, but it had fallen to a sinkhole. And somebody else would say something like, oh, I heard a, you know, a meteor fell out of the sky and crushed the whole city. Uh, the one thing that was common is that the companion that once stood overhead, uh, this gift from a long time ago that was provided by a celestial to drive out all evils from the city, everybody agreed that it no longer stood in the sky. It seems like it either faded or exploded or fell into the sinkhole with the city. There are many whispers, almost as many people as there are. There are different rumors for what happened to the city. The one thing that is common is that they all are moving away under the watchful guide of the Hell Riders, which brings our camera forward. Back to the dark-skinned, burgundy-haired, weathered leader of the Hell Riders, which your character knows to be Rhea Mantamorn, the inspiring leader who has always taken care of the Hell Riders always had the best interest of El Terrell, always had the best interest of the citizens, every every moment of their life dedicated to the preservation of good and, and health of the people of El Terrell and the, the wider realm at large. Your character, uh, Minerva, why don't you go ahead and describe Minerva to us as they march along this inspiring leader? Sorry. <laughs> Mom watching. Oh, wait, so my character's description is that where we, is, is that what i'm okay um uh, i mean you pretty much nailed it i mean just the you know the hard end of things uh other than the chain like the i guess it would be heavy armor uh, i mean the darkened of the armor uh this bluish blue heart and necklace that she's wearing uh she just seems like she just has like a like a focused kind of like aspect she's like five foot eight i'd say she seems like she's in a bright kind of like like brightish kind of mindset but like focused you know like to get to the point you know um looks like i guess somebody that you really wouldn't tamper with i guess unless you get smacked i guess <laughs> Before we delve any deeper into the tapestry of our tale, we must first unravel the threads that brought our characters to this moment, each strand woven from the fabric of trials and destiny, their journeys, disparate and tangled, converge on this path on the way to Baldur's Gate. Rose, the porcelain warforged, once graced the halls of her creator, Daguerre, a master of ingenuity and compassion. Her existence, a symphony of melodies and gentle kindness, was shattered in an instant. The night her master was cruelly slain, a casualty of the dark designs that lurk within the city's heart. Rose was left adrift, the harmony of her world silenced by the discord of loss. Yet even in her grief, a new command was etched into her core by another unknown entity, Explore. Thus, she set forth a beacon of serenity amidst the cacophony of the realm's despair, unknowingly holding keys to mysteries deep and ancient within her. Jacques Thibault's tale is one of unexpected departure from a life less ordinary. Raised aboard the Toothsome Emporium by Charleston, his inventive father, Jacques' curiosity was boundless, his world a floating testament to creativity and wonders untold. Yet fate, unbidden, intervened. A tumultuous storm sent the Emporium reeling, casting Jacques from the skies on a makeshift glider. His cargo, a mere bag of tools, chocolate, and Tinky, his earliest creation. Landing amidst the turmoil of the Sword Coast, Jacques, propelled by the thrill of the unknown, ventured towards Baldur's Gate, his father's warnings of curiosity's peril, a distant echo against the spirit of adventure. Kid, the satyr whose origins are veiled in the shadows of Avernus itself, harbors secrets not of his making, but of fate's cruel design. Escaping the infernal clutches of a realm torn asunder by the blood war, Kid's journey is marked by silent knowledge, the truth of Elturel's fate, 
etched into his very being. His escape, a tale untold, positions him uniquely as the bearer of truths too perilous to share, too profound to understand. Among the refugees, his presence is an enigma. His insights into Elturel's downfall, a mosaic of hints and silence, a story waiting to unfold beneath the watchful eyes of celestial and infernal forces alike. Minerva, clad in the full regalia of the Hellriders, embodies the spirit of Elturel's most storied defenders. Her journey from the smoldering ruins of her past to the ranks of the Hellriders was forged in the crucible of loss and vengeance. With the tragic fall of her parents at the hands of her uncle, Minerva's path became one of righteous fury, her every step a march towards retribution. The calamity that befell Elturel has not dampened her resolve, but rather steeled it, turning her grief into a shield against despair and her rage into a sword against wickedness. Together, these souls find themselves amidst a caravan of hope and despair, their paths a confluence of unseen forces and hidden destinies. As they march toward Baldur's Gate, each carries a piece of the puzzle, their stories a beacon guiding them through the shadowed paths that lay ahead. As the camera leaves the refugees behind marching down the street, a light rain falls in from the coast. We transition back to the scene, the tail end of the conversation between our original three party members that we met. Deanne, Morrigan, and Zaheer. Meeting and discussing their history and how they came here. Uh, well, as you come back in... <laughs> Deanne is kind of standing, arms crossed, looking at Morgan, not distrustfully, but a little bit wary. She's just met this person, and so do you Do you have any idea what she was getting at, what she uncovered, why she called me here, or why she would call us together? Why I would call you, or why your sister would? Why Marvine, my sister, would call me. I'm not, Morgan's not really sure what all she should say to you or to Deanne in general because her sister had a lot of secrets and Morgan made money in keeping secrets. What she did say is to trust you, Deanne. Not sure why, because you and your sister were close, but in the way that you are close. But she did say that we had to look for someone and that there was people that we couldn't trust. And she told me that I can trust you. And if there's anything that I knew about your sister, it's that she, when it comes to important things, she never lies. I'm not so sure about never lies, but well, she knew when to tell the truth. And she knew when to, and she knew how to make sure you knew she was telling the truth. <laughs> Is Little Caesar here, uh, randomly shuffling a deck of cards, trying to act inconspicuous and still look around. To understand our next and final character, we have to go back to how he arrived in this adventure. In the shadow of unfolding chaos, Yarick's world turned upside down when the authority he had pledged his life to protect fell under the cloud of dark allegations. The arrest of Baron Arneil Celerand from the city guard for dealings too sinister for the light of day set Yarick on a path far from the familiar grounds of loyalty and knighthood. With his honor bound to the truth, he departed from the comfort of his known world, venturing into the heart of uncertainty with a single lead, the enigmatic advice of a tiefling stranger whose name was not shared, unspoken, but whose guidance would illuminate the darkness. This clandestine advisor, shrouded in mystery, pointed Yark towards Captain Zodge of the Flaming Fist, a beacon of potential allyship in a city twisted by noble intrigue and shadowed deals. With a heavy heart and a mind swirling with questions, Yark found himself donning the mantle of the city's defense, not as a knight for his baron, but as a guardian at the gates of Baldur's Gate, where dangers both known and unnamed threatened to spill into the streets he vowed to protect. His instructions were clear yet weighed heavy with consequence. The influx of refugees at the Basilisk Gate, fleeing disasters and dark omens, was a tide of desperation and fear. Among them, 
Hidden threats lurked, cultists, blending seamlessly with the innocent, their malevolent intentions cloaked in despair. More alarming were the rumors of Hellriders, those fabled defenders of Elturel, now whispered to be harbingers of its doom. By command, any spotted within the throng were to be arrested, a decree that set Yarnik's sense of justice against the tide of orders. As we pull back the curtain on this scene, standing tall at the Basilisk Gate, the figure of Yarik emerges, a bulwark against the encroaching shadows. The air is charged with tension, the weight of his decisions a heavy cloak upon his shoulders. In this moment of anticipation, what guise does Yarik adopt? What visage does he present to those who seek refuge within the city's walls, and to those who might dare to challenge the peace he has sworn to uphold? Can you describe Yarik for us in this moment? Uh, sure. Yarik is uh, above average height, but only slightly. But he's kind of an imposing figure because of this this armor that makes him look a bit bulkier. Uh, dark green skin, dark black hair, uh, bright green eyes looking out through this basilisk gate. And probably the most notable thing about his appearance is that he's keeping all of his armor covered with a, a long linen cloak that's kind of just wrapped around him. Uh, including a shield that he has another piece of linen draped over. He's got a spear strapped to his back, and he's kind of just looking out this gate, just wondering when these people will arrive. Yeah, uh, almost as if beckoned by his thought of when it will arrive. Amidst the swirling mists that cling to the coastal edges of the Sword Coast, the Basilisk Gate stands as a monument to the tumultuous heart of Baldur's Gate. Here, at the city's threshold, a scene of desperate clamor unfolds, a microcosm of the city's frayed edges and the world's creeping shadows. On the city side, Diane, Morrigan, and Zaheer find themselves amidst a growing commotion. The air is thick with the tension of discord, where the fear of the guildsmen clashes with the commoners' pleas. Voices rise in a cacophony of desperation and anger, and the guildsmen staunch in their resolve to preserve the city from further chaos, their concerns fueled by recent devastations wrought by the sinister cult of the Dead Three. In contrast, the commoners, their faces etched with lines of worry and wear, argue for compassion, their voices laced with the urgency of reuniting with family members who stand but a gate away from safety. Across the gate, an expanse of uncertainty and longing stretches. The refugee camp, a sprawl of tattered tents and weary souls, bears the marks of journeys fraught with peril. Huddled figures gather round meager fires, their flickering light casting long shadows across faces haunted by the memory of a city lost to calamity. Minerva, flanked by the determined Hellriders, stands at the forefront, her resolve mirrored in the eyes of those who look toward the gate with a mix of hope and despair. Within this throng, unnoticed by those who debate their fate, are Rose, Kid, and Jacques, each bearing tales of crossings and escapes, their paths now converging on this singular point of tension. Rose's music, a balm to the weary, weaves through the crowd, her presence a delicate note of resilience amid the fray. Kid, the bearer of truths too heavy for one's soul, watches the gate with a knowing gaze, the secrets of worlds beyond hang slightly between breaths. Jacques, ever the seeker of the new, finds in the crowd's faces stories yet untold, his own journey paused at the precipice of discovery. Yarik, stationed at the gate, is caught between duty and the growing unease of injustice. The orders are clear, no passage without interrogation, a process designed to deter rather than welcome. Yet the sight of gathered refugees, the sound of their pleas, and the knowledge of the Hellrider's cause stirs a turmoil within him, a battle between allegiance and the call of a deeper moral compass. As the storm clouds gather, rolling in from the bay with a promise of rain, the atmosphere around the basilisk gate tightens with the electric charge of impending change. It is a moment poised on the edge of decision, where the fate of many hangs balanced on the actions of a few, and in this gathering storm, the eight souls, destined to shape the course of this tale, stand divided by walls of stone and decree. Yet. Bound by the invisible threads of fate, there are stories yet to weave into a tapestry of adventure and revelation. I turn the scene over to you as you arrive as described to a closed gate protected by an armored 
militia of types. You can see every 25 to 30 feet the walls are stationed, manned, and guarded, and there are four guards at the front, slowly interrogating everybody, taking their time. What do you want to do in this scene? I think that our jockeys is just kind of like munching on like a chocolate bar uh, and just kind of like watching the chaos unfold, just like this is entertaining and like it's kind of whispering to his teddy bear on his shoulder. I was so, a kid holding a teddy bear <laughs> like chaos. I'm not really sure if I trust that. <laughs> What's going on with that over there? <laughs> You don't have any weapons or anything either? At this point, the tension at the Basilisk Gate is beginning to reach a boiling point. Inside the city, the crowd's unrest stirs into a storm. Voices, sharp and frantic, escalate as the guildsmen block the gate, their rigid lines forming a barrier not just of bodies, but of implacable resolve. The air, already thick with the salty tang of the bay, now vibrates with the charged energy of impending conflict. Commoners, their patients frayed by fear and desperation, press forward. Their movements, once pleading, become forceful, shoving against the cold iron of the gate, the metal groaning under the weight of the collective despair. On the other side of this divide, the scene starkly contrasts with the brewing tumult inside. The refugees, led by the stoic Hellriders, maintain a vigil of hopeful quietude. Their faces, marked by the trials of their exodus, turn towards the gate with expressions mingled with hope and solemnity. The camp behind them whispers of hardship. The tattered tents flap in the gusting winds. Fire circles crackle and pop, and people shuffle, trying to keep warm as they clutch to their meager belongings. Yet, their resolve to maintain peace stands undeterred by the city's chaos visible just beyond the bars. This dichotomy between the inner turmoil and outer calm underscores the imminent threat of violence. As the disputes inside intensify, the flaming fist guards at the gate find themselves at the crux of maintaining order, their eyes darting nervously between the agitated mob within and the quiet multitude outside. The air is ripe with the potential for violence, each shout and shove inside a spark near a powder keg, while outside the refugees watch, their breath held in anxious anticipation of the gate that remains closed against them. The tension suggests that it will take just a little more to erupt, a stark reminder of the delicate balance that holds, but may not hold for much longer. Uh, Yark would turn to the people inside Baldur's Gate at this point and just say, everybody please step back. We have, <laughs> the gate's getting a bit crowded. The Flaming Fist needs their room to work. Please don't come any closer. The Flaming Fist, Baldur's Gate's formidable militia, stands as the city's bulwark against the encroaching tides of chaos. Not heralded for mercy or leniency, they are a group defined by their unwavering resolve and martial prowess, enforcing order with an iron fist. To them, violence is not just a tool, but a necessity, a means to maintain the thin veneer of peace in a city teetering on the edge of disorder. They operate under a belief that the end justifies the means. Morality is a luxury in the relentless pursuit of stability, and their actions, though often perceived as brutal, are deemed essential for the greater good of Baldur's Gate. Yarick, who is at, aligned with the fists at least temporarily, finds himself among ranks where strength is respected, and he has a lot of that. They do not dabble in the gray areas of justice. They are the line in the sand. They are the shield against the darkness, but one forged from the same iron as the sword, the sole representation of consequence separating citizens from anarchy that threatens to consume the city and its inhabitants, a reminder that the devil you may know is often less dangerous than the devil you don't. Yeah, they sound like dicks. Yeah, well, hell. <laughs> <laughs> ah, we are two trust. And trust ourselves to a bunch of dicks that track. <laughs> <laughs> if there was some place to back up to next to a wall, Zahir would do it to give himself something to be able to a not only lean against, but if in a fight, wouldn't have to watch his back. Mm. Yeah, it seems. Yeah, it definitely needs to stand far apart from everyone, which would be a little impossible, but mostly. Everyone looks a little desperate, right? Desperate people do desperate things. I don't trust that. Well, also, I hope there's like someone that we know 
it had a trampoline of all the people who would want to be able to see. Yeah, so as you're trying to position yourself somewhere you can see through the gate, thankfully there's a break in the crowd because Yark called out for them to push back, and the guildsmen, made up of carpenters, porters, blacksmiths, other beefy bod rough types, start pushing the crowd back, allowing you to get up to the gate and see through. So why is there someone made of gold with a heart? You guys carry the weirdest trinket. <laughs> Yeah, uh, it's called a shamisen, I think, uh, but it's close. Emerald, would Rose be somewhere folks could see her visibly from the inside of the gate? Hi, I don't have that. Shamisen? Uh, what's it called? Uh, and she's actually, she's like, she's like, excuse me, excuse me, and she's kind of like weaving towards the front of the crowd, just making sure she's not like bumping anyone as she does and trying to be as polite as possible. Um, just to get oh, to... Is she get just to get as far up as she can before an authority figure stops her. Yeah, so the crowd is doing its best, as instructed by Rhea Mantelmorn and the other Hellriders, to maintain as much order as possible. Every now and then there's someone who gets out of line and gets, lines up again, or someone who works their way into the ranks, but for the most part, it's e very easy for her to work her way through the crowd. Uh, she gets up to the front, where the Hellriders have dismounted their horses and instructed someone to take them to one of the stables nearby, as uh, Baldur's Gate doesn't allow any animals bigger than a bread box. Uh, so they're now having a, a discussion, but it's easier for, for Rose to just walk up if she wants to ask a question. She hasn't been hostile, she hasn't been vocalizing any complaints, she's been very pleasant, so no one really has a reason to stop her. What? Why are we stopped? Gotta figure that myself. <laughs> she's gonna walk towards the main group of guards that are, like, stopping everyone, um, and just, like, like, quietly. Like, she's walking very calm and collectively, there's no real emotion, um, and she's just gonna kind of, like, wave to one of them and go, excuse me. One second, miss, uh... Whose construct is this? Why are you here? She'll she'll turn towards the crowd and like go on her and point at one of the women in the back and is like, that woman asked me to help her into Baldur's Gate. Would you mind letting us through? Uh, 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 yes, everyone will be given a chance to represent themselves to the Flaming Fist and plead their case. Those with sponsors or contacts in the city, please step forward. We have implemented a quick process to protect our citizens from the threat of hidden cultists among you. We are on the lookout for ne'er-do-wells aligned to the Dead Three, Ball, Bane, Merkel, and for troublemakers responsible for the tragedy that has befallen your city, Elturel. They will be taken for questioning immediately. If you see something, say something. And how long does it take to get through all of this? It, it could be days, could be weeks. It depends on how many people cooperate. Well, I can assure you that I've talked to everyone here, and none of them are cultists from what they've told me. I'm surely not. <laughs> well, why didn't you say so? Oh, well, the cultists of the Dead Three and the folks with information about Elturel, please identify yourself. I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> I know that this guy. Go well. Yeah, so while Zir is familiar with military demonstrations and enforcement, he kind of is viewing the situation through that lens, expecting it to explode soon. Morgan finds a familiar face out in the crowd. Having crossed ways with Minerva before, she recognizes the trustworthy, possibly even likable knight on the other side of the gate. How long do you think it will take before it'll stop? I don't think very long. Like an hour? We got time for a game of, game of dice if you want. And I'll put the cards away and pull out dice and start rolling on top of a barrel. <laughs> yeah, I think filled with memories of military force keeping the peace, Zahir estimates there's probably less than an hour, uh, but still long enough to tip a crate over, sit down for a quick game of Devil's Bounty. Oh, no point rushing into a fight. Get here on its own. Yeah, let's Wait, see. Uh, see is there any way to like get in, like sneak in, or is it like full? Yeah. Well, via this path through the gate, it's pretty tight. There's like a 10 foot wide gap with the gate on both sides and four guards interrogating everybody. But as you look across the muddy refugee camp, you notice there's a slightly more packed, possibly graveled path to the north. And there was no way through this gate? <laughs> no, your best guess is that if you wanted to go through this gate, you'd either have to talk, fight, or be invisible and fly over the heads of the guards. Where, where is Minerva again? Minerva is standing next to the now dismounted leader of the Hellriders, so you probably wouldn't know they're Hellriders because their banner went with the horses to the stables. Uh, but you can see her jet black hair, that familiar big blue sapphire heart pendant, and the I will kick your ass look on her face. She's not a horse people, but she looks like a horse people. Not. <laughs> 
What? <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> like, like she won't listen. It's what I meant. Yeah. Uh, no, she wears the same uh-huh. armor, and she's seen in very close proximity to them. For all intents and purposes, she looks like she's part of the same group as them. She just doesn't have a horse. So the air inside Baldur's Gate is already tense with the escalating disputes among the commoners, and then it's suddenly rent by a chilling scream that pierces the clamor like a knife. Deanne, Zahir, and Morrigan, who are sitting across the courtyard within the walls, freeze as a horrific sound washes over them, originating from the calm outside the gates. Simultaneously, at the gate itself, Yarek's eyes snap instinctively to a gruesome scene unfolding with brutal swiftness. A cultist, who has peeled back his mask, his face a fervent uh, madness on it, draws a serrated blade across the throat of a flaming fist guard that he had worked his way behind. The guard's hand clutched helplessly at his neck, his very life spurting between his fingers in violent jets, painting the cobblestone in glistening crimson. His body crumples in a heap, his last gasping breath failing to escape the red ruin of his throat. The crowd erupts into pandemonium. The courtyard clears in an instant. More cultists reveal themselves outside, clad in dark robes, marked by forbidding symbols. They wield blades dipped in malice. With ruthless efficiency, they run through the crowd, slashing at anyone within reach, refugee or guard alike. And then they run, retreating into the refugee camp, leaving behind streaks of blood and screams that tear through the gathering storm overhead. Men, women, children, they all stumble backwards, tripping over each other in their desperate bid for safety, many only finding themselves facing the cold steel of yet another cultist's wrath. The once orderly queue of refugees transforms into a desperate scrum with pushing, shoving, and tramping as they attempt to escape the unexpected assault. The sounds of metal clashing, people screaming, and the sickening thuds of falling bodies create a cacophony of horror that underscores the brutal reality of the city's underbelly. This violence is not just an attack. It is a statement, a blood declaration that no one, not even the police, are safe from the dark forces that seek to tear Baldur's Gate apart. We get here soon enough. Mm. <laughs> While some of your characters are battle hardened, others are a little less fighty. I want to know, in the face of this conflict and violence, what is the initial response for your characters? What are your first and immediate thoughts? Rose is going to heal the guard that just got stabbed. First thing, <laughs> not gonna lie, I kind of want to do something stupid. <laughs> oh, more. great start to combat. Um, I believe that with my subclass, I should have the darkness spell and I should be able to see in the darkness. Uh, I do think that's something you give with a subclass, yeah, but do you get it right away? I think it was right away with the subclass. Wow, that's huge. Uh, darkness is like a level two spell or something. I believe it's level three. I believe that it's level 3 also. Oh, it is? Okay, let me look it up. Um, yeah, so you get the dark vision. That isn't affected by magical darkness right away. Uh, but the feat that comes with it doesn't give you the darkness until you become level 3. Then you get the spell. Ah, okay. I like it. I enjoy it. Okay, so now as I transition you over to the encounter map, you'll see some of our adventures are on the left side, which are inside the city, some are on the right side, which are outside the city, and then you should be able to see your tokens and glean the situation. There are some cultists who did not run off into the distance, and some remaining walking wounded. Uh, can you guys all see your tokens? Uh, yeah, I can Now I can, yes. Okay, it's been a minute since I've done this. Okay, so quick roll call, I got Yarek at the gate. I've got the refugees out here in the camp, and uh, for our audience at home, I can click here and I can show you a sneak peek of what the players see as their tokens. Uh, so some of them, like Rose, have a great view through the portcullis, even though it's closed, whereas others, like Zakir, are at an angle where they can't see who's outside. We're just waiting. You're just waiting? We're just waiting. <laughs> Okay, now that you're on the map here, I'll paint a more clear picture of what's happening using the tokens on the screen. Uh, so let me move these guys to the token layer. Awesome. So this is what the cultist looks like who kicked off the party. Uh, big, dark markings on his face, blade, cloak, unnerving smile across his face, taking pure joy in the chaos he's sowing. Uh, and it's not so much an attack so much it was the guard was investigating someone else this man moved unassumingly behind the guard and opened his neck then revealed himself to be a cultist by pulling his hood back I like it 
I don't like it. Okay, one sec, just organizing my thoughts here. <laughs> yeah. For those of you that are outside and in close proximity, it's hard to identify the cultists by look as some of them have are concealed by cloaks. Uh, many of them are just like the refugees who are expecting rain. But it's their movements and their expressions that give their identity away when you're in close proximity. As you look left and right at the refugees next to you, some of you realize you are standing immediately next to another cons- uh, cultist. Ha, I almost called them consultants. So, it's time for the first roll for initiative of the campaign. Uh, a most exciting moment that cannot be interrupted by anything, nothing at all, nothing. Uh, a bit anticlimactic, but at this point we had a small hiccup getting everyone into the initiative, so we're going to fast forward past the lengthy technical difficulties uh, and get right into the action. I did log out and log back in and try that. Try exiting out and coming back in. It works for me. There we go. Yeah, yeah, I had to just refresh it, I guess. Okay, um, I already rolled, so do you want to input that? Oh, okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll get it all sorted out here. Don't, don't want to cheat. <laughs> okay. Okay, so the scene has been described, the characters react to the horror, and as Deanne prepares for the first act here, we cut to commercial for a quick word from our sponsors, or we would if we had any. Uh, if this were a real cartoon, we would jump in after that. So with the end, you being the, the weathered knight that you are, uh, you have the first reaction to the sounds of violence. You have the distinct honor of taking the first action in our first encounter of the entire campaign. Okay. Uh, well, when I hear that, you know, switch clicks, I, I know what those battle cries mean, those, I guess, prayers, perhaps you could say. I, you know, we- weapon and shield out, I look over to where... Uh, um, Morgan and Z and Zir and Zahir are, and I just you know shout them, "Come on!" And I run up to the gate where Yarik is, and you know, I basically say to him, "You know, come on, let me out there. I, you know, I want to fight. I want to help them. Let me out. Open the gate." Yep, good opportunity here to present a house rule. I'm totally okay with talking being a free action if we keep it within a reasonable blurb that fits within a six interval second. Uh, along with running, attacking, casting verbal components of spells, etc. Combat's not really the time to read an excerpt from War and Peace, but that level of communication that you've you know described is totally fine. I would say that Yarik can reply if he wants to, because uh, yeah. all, all combat is happening simultaneously, but you can't take actions. <laughs> uh, yes, then, then I would respond and just say, uh, I'm trying everything I can. It'll be a moment. Please step back. And she in the way just as frustrated as most people would feel. <laughs> okay. Uh, so next up is a cultist of Bane, who I forget the markings of Bane at this exact moment, but uh, he's wearing whatever that is, and he's smiling as he's standing over his fallen foe here, uh, looking for his next victim to sacrifice to the Lord of Murder. And who does he find except Minerva? Hey. Hey. Yeah, you send me some notes. Uh, God of Tyranny, cults very militaristic, te- you know, Dominion's fear and control, that sort of thing. Oh, right, yeah. Uh, for those following along, <laughs> I gave each player a bit of lore regarding things their characters would know better than the average person. Uh, for instance, Deanne, who's been a paragon of good in her life, knows a thing or two about fighting the cults of the Dead Three, the Dragon Cult, the cults of other anomalies like the Raven Queen, uh, or horrors of the Demon Lords, etc., etc. Okay, bit of first session jitters here, but I'm going to open up some windows that have GM sensitive information, so I'll be doing my best to censor that. Uh, but it's possible that there will be information here our players are not supposed to be privy to, so don't tell them. Okay, thanks. Alrighty, as we roll back into speed here, the cultist who kicked everything off is going to brush off the cloak from his other arm, revealing a sickening maze that he tries to bring up under Minerva's arm into her side. Uh, he's going to do a wackadoo on you. <laughs> Whack. Failing to find his target. Uh, next up is this cultist with the paintings of Ball decorating his body. As the guards move to establish order in the area, he pulls a wicked curved serrated blade and rakes it across the shoulder and chest of this farmer here next to them, uh, washing himself in the bloody aftermath. 
really a flesh wound. <laughs> Airway in the knee. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, another cultist with the same blade, same markings, and same zeal is going to rush at the guards at the gate, bringing his blade down with two hands. But as his blade misses his target, he disappears. And a good opportunity for some rules lawyering here. An invisible creature is targetable as long as you know where they are. He cannot take the hide action because he took the attack action on his turn. Uh, but any attacks that require you to see him won't work, and any attacks otherwise have disadvantage. Okay, the last cultist here is going to take advantage of the confusion with his disappearing ally and sink his dagger into his target. Okay, is it here? You're up. Um, he will slowly start walking. And as he's walking, um, he'll put the dice away, slowly pull out a bow, and take a shot. Are these the bad guys? So it's difficult to pick out the cultists because you didn't see the inciting action, and they specifically made themselves look like refugees. Really quickly, can I see anybody that has blood on their dagger then? Okay, or more of these first session good. jitters here. The input for the screen wasn't aligned with the tokens on the screen, so we had to reload the whole interface. And we're back. Yeah. Yeah, mine was too. Okay. I will... Uh, who did you say? Yeah, though you're a ways away, you can visibly see this man uh, here. Oh, beautiful. Uh, yeah, I just noticed that too. Morgan's missing. I'm gonna. There's one of them supposed yeah. to be ahead of me. Okay, one more example of first session jitters. Look, I don't call myself the Ness and DM for nothing. Uh, let's see who isn't in the turn order. Yeah, let's let them roll. Yeah, somehow I didn't get Kid or Morgan in the turn order. So if you go into your character sheets in the middle column, there's a title above your hit points. Uh, it says initiative. If you scroll over it, it'll turn red uh, and you can roll initiative that way. <laughs> I'm dropping a screenshot of it in our Discord chat. Did it work? Okay. Uh, let me get you two sorted into the turn tracker. Or, yeah. So she can cut ahead of me and start. Yep. How do I know what it was? Uh, the results from all your rolls from your character okay. sheet will show up in the roll 20 chat on the right. Moved it. Uh, a little more technical difficulty as we learn the platform here. Just gonna. Okay, here we go. Oh, um, definitely. At the sound of combat, I would like to walk over and stand on the other side of the arc. How would I do that? Okay, on a computer with a mouse, you can click and drag your token, uh, or you can click your token and use the direction keys. Thank you. I can see better. And I would say, hi, Yari, because I know that guy. Yeah, so yet another person that Morgan knows, or at least has seen before, uh, seemingly popping up everywhere today. Mm-hmm, yeah, just another one. Um, oh, there's so many people out there. Like, are they fighting again? It's probably too far to do, but we're behind the gate. Correct. You are a little ways away, uh, maybe 80 feet or so from the nearest target. Yeah. That gives you an indication. <laughs> oh, yeah. So that's Malcolm measuring the distance. Thanks, mate. It's a little far. Um, no. I kind of, kind of like um, the sound of fighting because I usually I get to fight too. And also, if you save people, they owe you favors. I too have a, I believe, a crossbow and some bolt. I don't think it goes very. Hmm? Yeah, I think it's a short crossbow. Not really. Mine's 80 and 320. 
throw if hers is a light, it should be the same. All right, let's take a peek at your character sheet. Okay, so you can see the range of the weapon next to where you would click its attack. And it looks like you're in range of this whole crowd, uh, but admittedly at disadvantage. They're just slightly outside. Yeah, so the same thing I told Zir. Unfortunately, the cultists are blending in with the remaining refugees, but you do see some of them have blood on them, and one in particular is brandishing a weapon at Minerva. This one here. It's funny because on my screen you are um, pointing at Minerva. <laughs> no, it's like I don't know to run. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Please don't. <laughs> I mean, I kind of, I kind of want to get her attention. So I'm kind of like this year. So wait, would she just see the guard holding around Minerva? Yeah, I think now that the conflict is evolving, you can see, more yeah. easily see the ones engaging with Minerva and the guards. Uh, the ones over by Kid and Jacques are a bit harder to pick out. Guard hacking cultists, or is it? Like, are they guard, or are they? Yeah, yeah. The Hellrider guards immediately took up arms to fight the cultists. The flaming fists are helping, but it looks like their primary goal is to still keep people out of the city, like contain the problem. Real quick, and then people with the yellow backgrounds are guards. People with red backgrounds are cultists. Yeah, that won't be true in every encounter. I want to shoot that person with a crossbow. How do I do that? So in your character sheet, you should see the attack actions you have available to you. Uh, they have an attack name and a damage. Mm -hmm. If you hover over the title, it turns red, and that means it's clickable. Uh, just click the one that says crossbow, and it'll make the attack roll for you. I can also drop it in Discord here. Once we determine whether the attack meets or hits the AC of the target, you can either click the name of the attack in the chat log of Roll20, or you can click the damage description in your character sheet. Either one will roll the damage. Mm-hmm. I see that. Oh. Found it. Okay, so that's a hit. Just click the part of the title in the attack in the chat, or you can go through the character sheet and click the damage next to the attack name. All right. One more fast forward here. Uh, just trying to learn the platform. I'll let it go. Hey. So as this cultist is trying to pull their weapon back, getting ready to make another attack, and they aren't really expecting a crossbow bolt to come flying through the gate, you manage to sink a crossbow bolt into their shoulder. Sadly for this guard, it was a little too late. Uh, the cultist <laughs> runs them through. So as he kills that guard, we go to Zaheer. Uh, unless you have anything else you want to do, Morrigan. Um, I'm too far. No worries. Okay, Zaheer. I'm gonna do the same thing. That's tight, buddy. Oof. I missed. Okay, so as the hero waits for the gates to open, he levels his crossbow across a battle, uh, attempts to fire it off at the target, but just couldn't find a good path. This cultist, who's just a garden variety cultist with a scary looking mask, takes out a sacrificial knife and attempts to slash at the flaming fist guard, dealing a nasty cut at the joist between the axillary area of their armor. Possibly more menacing if you're looking at appearances. Uh, this cultist pulls back their overcoat, revealing a collection of skins, desiccated heads, and bones rattling on cords uh, of braided hair <laughs> around their torso. <laughs> then an iron flail in the shape of a skull drops into attack position as they run up screaming, I'll take your head for the Lord of Bones, swinging their mace wildly. As they make two attacks on the leader's Rhea, uh, but being the seasoned soldier she is, she definitely swats the attacks aside. Cultist, again, generic brand cultist, will turn to the closest target they think they can maim to bring fear and ruin uh, and hone in on their new target, Jacques, seeking an easy yet significant kill. <laughs> you kids. <laughs> That's not correct. <a> <laughs> Uh, so they'll bring their scimitar down on Jock, making a pretty connection with one of his arms, leaving either a bloody glove, a bloody gauntlet, uh, what a greaves, whatever he's wearing. Wow. 
No. Can I reaction cast shield? Yes, you can. Okay, I'll do that. Uh, plus five, so it'd be 21. All right, so as we see the scimitar coming down, getting ready to spill Jacques' life essence onto the now wet ground from the starting rain, Damn. we see a pulse of arcane energy pulse out from Jacques at the very last possible second, shunting the attack to the side so it sinks into the mud below. Gotcha. Yeah, good save. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the cultist, obviously surprised at the unexpected difficulty he's having killing what seems to be an unarmed refugee, uh, looks closer and sees a jubilant energy beaming from Jacques. Oh, oh so exciting, guys. Um, Jacques <laughs> is going to just, uh, like, biggest glint of eye in his eyes, most excited look on his face you've ever seen. My first battle, oh my gosh, guys. Um, he's going to cast um, Arcane Weapon on his, uh, as he takes out this kind of just like chain. It looks like scrap, but he seems to be using it almost as like a whip. Uh, he's going to cast Arcane Weapon on it. Post that for you guys. Um, as it kind of starts to crackle with this like lightning energy as he slaps it on the ground, uh, I'm going to choose Lightning Damage. Um, and he's going to cast uh, as his action. He's going to do booming blade. Yeah. Let this guy here that attacked him. Sorry, I'm just trying to find the concentration icon I used before, but apparently I didn't upload my custom token markers to this campaign yet. That's gonna be four slashing. It's going to be more lightning, and if he moves, he's going to take some thunder damage. I love it. So as his makeshift whip cracks out with a resounding clap, it collides with the cultist's chest, sending arcane lightning across the his lightning body, whip, uh, forcing his limbs rigid, his eyes nearly roll back in his head. <laughs> yeah, even without a perception check, you smell excrement in this man's trousers. Uh, okay. Sparrow, you are up next with Kid. Oh. <laughs> it is. Yep, look at my spells. Can I check if my spells are a bonus action or an action? Or how do I check that? Uh, yeah, so in your character sheet in the spell tab, when you open a spell card, uh, it will tell you the casting time. Typically, that's either an action, but sometimes it's a bonus action or a reaction. All right, another break here where we're going through the specific character sheet of a, of a player referencing what spells have casting times versus, you know, actions of bonus actions and how to find those. Big hurt. Yay. Get him. Yeah, big hurt indeed. He looked at me funny. Punishable by death for sure. Yeah, so we see Kid lower his head, drag his foot through the dirt, give a small hop, and then charge into the cultist, thrusting his head forward as they reach the target. Uh, the whole thing is very iconic of Kid's bestial side, uh, with the caprine legs, horns, and short tail. <laughs> so we see this man who has his face painted white under a dark cowl to look like a skeleton's visage, take a big hit in the abdomen, and arches back to try to lift What are we Kid. using for concentration? What's the symbol? Oh yeah, I forgot I was looking for that. Um, we'll be using a different token markers in the future, so for now, let's just use the clock. Okay. Uh, so I think that's Zaheer. Iron Hand is. Right. Sparrow. Oh, where is he? Yeah. Where I am. Kid. Jacques. Uh, cool, 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 cool. Okay, Minerva, your turn. Um, I would just like to turn around and give this dude a little, or Minerva would like to turn around and give this dude a little smack. <laughs> With her sword, of course. <laughs> Excellent. So Minerva, who was previously looking at the gate, turns towards her assailant, grips her sword tight, knuckles straining under the grasp, uh, and uh, 
uh, brings the sword up underneath her attacker, finding purchase in their abdomen. Are you attacking uh, two-handed, or does she have her shield in one hand? Uh, two-handed, please. Okay. Um, how, how do I... How do you differentiate that? Oh, it's... Okay. Yeah, so the macro for that weapon rolls both and then gives a damage for each. You have to decide before the attack if it was one or two-handed. Uh, if it's two-handed, you have to doff the shield, which lowers your armor class until you put it back on. So after after this attack, now that I remember, I'm actually he's wielding a shield. <laughs> I guess next turn, uh, like how would how that would go about? Yeah, so uh, in the character sheet, there's an option to equip or unequip items. If you're gonna attack two-handed, you just click the uh, the button to unequip the shield. It'll adjust your AC okay. automatically. I don't know how it works in D and D Beyond, but I'm sure it's a similar mechanic. Uh, I can. I think I can unequip it currently. Yeah, I can unequip it. Uh, okay. So yeah, two attack, bam. <laughs> cool, cool, cool. Yeah, I'm not very familiar with D and D Beyond, uh, so that's gonna be a learning curve for me. Okay, Rose, you're up. Um, does it look like the cultist intends to hurt me or just the guard? I think he's viewing you as a non-combatant, so his current quarry is the okay. guard. Uh, but he's got a crazy look of murder in his eyes, so like, don't be confused. He's going to kill everybody. Plus, he keeps yelling how everybody is an offer to the Lord of okay. the Murder. Um, I'm going to look behind me for a moment and just all of the chaos and see one person really standing out with a teddy bear. Uh, and I'm going to cast um, Shield of Faith onto them. Just give him a plus two with AC. <laughs> um, and then she'll she'll look back at the cultist and go like, "Sorry, I hope your kid gets better." And then shocking grass. <laughs> yeah, he is wearing metal armor, so you do have advantage on that one. Oh, nice. I'm gonna take the opportunity of him not having opportunity um, to move back over here. Yeah, so just like how you dance to the refugees on the journey here, uh, you definitely step away, you begin retreating to relative safety. Shield the food is plus two, right? And then I'm concentrating on that. Perfect, we'll mark that with the clock. And... All right, so we'll go back to the skull face guy, trying to tip the goat man off his feet. He gives up, rears back to bring his mace down on Kid's spine. I can only tell you how much that would really hurt having been hit by real goats. Just so we're clear. Yikes. Uh, okay, yeah, and he's able to land the mace on Kid's back, but he's only dealing uh, a minimum of one <laughs> bludgeoning damage to him. And finally, uh, at the end of combat, we have Yarek, who despite his training, for some reason was his last to act. How do I get this gate open? I think Yarek's familiar enough with it, so he can just like flip a lever. It'll open. Fantastic. I, that's exactly what I do then. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so those of you who are inside see the gate slowly rise up as the <laughs> mechanism releases. And those of you outside in the heat of battle hear the iconic sound of heavy gates rising slowly. Uh, then I will rush 30 feet forward. Uh, and I'll pull a, a javelin off of my belt, and I'll aim it at uh, me. Uh, this one on the flank, he seems like the clearest target for me. Uh, although my javelin only has a 30-foot range, I believe, so it'll be a disadvantage, but I'm still going to throw it. Cool, cool. So as the full party arrives, Yarik runs through the gates, and as he nears the outer gate, he heaves a javelin, uh, pierces its target, and does... Uh, Four piercing. Okay. Four piercing. Cool, cool. Uh, four is enough. This cult is clutches the jazz and failingly slapping at us and tries to stein the uh, That is it. I'll just be standing guard at the gate. Next one up is the one fighting Minerva, uh, though he looks less convinced this is the best course, all things considered. Uh, Roll20 crashed and booted all of us, so... 
Okay, at the top or bottom of the turn order, the Hellrider guards and the Flaming Fist guards are going to start fighting back against the cultists. Uh, so the Flaming Fist guards are thrusting spears. Uh, the Hellrider guards have these mighty great swords that they're heaving at their targets. And then we're back to the top with DN. Gates open and I'm going to run out right after Yorick, step uh, right next to him. And I am going to throw my spear at uh, this guy right here, which I believe is the one who got shocked and grasped by Rose. Uh, yeah, go ahead and roll to hit. Okay. And that's a hit. All right. And... You got it. Yeah, uh, and as Out. the spear hits the stomach of the target, the cultist doubles over in pain and collapses over the spear. And uh, as I watch him go down, he's kind of tall out, so it's, you know, it's all... the guard. Um, that's the end of my turn. This next cultist is going to try to kill Minerva and run away. Their body language is like betraying their urgency to not be here anymore. Uh, unfortunately, it's a 19 to hit. Oh, yeah, that hits. <laughs> uh, Minerva, you take four more bludgeoning as this cultist hits you hard and looks to the south to see if there's a path that way to get out of this. Uh, let's jump to Minerva. You're up. Well, I like to get out of here. I would like to get down. So I'll run as far as I can. I'm inflexible. I can't go any further than that. Okay. Uh, okay, can you see the tabletop? I don't know what your your screen looks like, sorry. Okay. Okay, so every square is five feet, uh, and your character sheet should have a walking speed on it. So alternatively, you could pick up your token and you can click I Q, uh, and it'll show distances. There are any practical looking at you again? Um, so there's two valid targets here uh, one up by the Hellrider leader and one down by Minerva. On Minerva, because I know a guy. Oh. Yeah. Get an advantage. Yeah, uh, 21 is definitely a hit. Go ahead and roll damage. Are you dead yet? No. <laughs> uh, great. Anything else? Bonus action or movement? Um. I can't again, right? Oh, I'm not that smart. We're in that fast. It's fine, no worries. Uh, okay, so this cultist is going to continue sowing fear and chaos into the crowd by executing this refugee. Mm -hmm. And this one who disappeared last round is going to move, then reappear here, attacking out of the inv invisibility, uh, taking a chunk out of his target here, uh, the Hellrider Knight defending Rhea. Next up is the here. And it was this person. Uh, this yes. The one I'm picking here. I will take a quick shot at that one you say press for. Okay, an 18 does hit. Roll for damage. Um, yeah, that's everything I can do. Okay, eight more piercing for this one. All 
Alright, next one up here is <laughs> Has a Skull of Flail uh, going after the closest person, and that is Rhea. Next up is this generic brand cultist who's never been hit by a booming blade before, so he starts to run in total fear and then explodes like a scene from Death Race, uh, making it exactly <laughs> zero feet before he dies. Next up is Jacques. Uh, okay, well, I am going to. Where's my supreme intellect? Um, uh, I'll take an attack of opportunity. I'm actually going to move on a hooded. It's here. So, this hooded figure, this guy is. Up in, in. Yeah, so uh, as you run past, he misses you with an attack. Okay. Pressure. Uh, and then I'm being booming played this guy. Yeah, I'm having a lot of trouble tonight on it too. Right, it's like... Okay, uh, that's a hit. Okay, I still got arcing weapon up. Nice, nice, nice. Six slashing. Or uh, lightning damage. And he is vibrating. And then, you know what? I'm going to risk it for the biscuit, guys. I'm going to use the last five feet of movement to move back. That's fine. Time him to move more. Yeah, he'll take the bait. All good. It is a 17 to hit. Does not hit. Just barely missed this. Hooray. Thank you, Rose. Thank you. Thank you, that guy. All right, next up is Kid. Uh, it is your turn again as you are... In the middle fight. Oh, we're gonna do the same attack. We're just gonna. Yeah. Bro, he, he didn't learn his lesson the first time. Eight. Gotta do it again. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. I think that's just not enough, not enough to hit there. As you're maybe tangled up or trying to back up, or he's he's got his hands on you or something. Can I flip him off as a bonus action? Oh yeah, hand signs are, are free actions. Yeah. <laughs> oh, heck yeah. All right, that's all. All right, uh, next up we have Minerva. Uh, when equipping, re I guess re-equipping, the shield be in action? Uh, no, I think that's just an object interaction. Uh, object interaction? Yeah. Third. Okay, so equipping the shield would be... Uh, action, yes. Free action. Uh, free action. It, it's you get one object every turn. Oh, so it's like its own. Okay, cool. Mm -hmm. Didn't know that. Okay. Well, she would like to equip her shield. Um, back to one handing this the, the sword. Yes, and she's going to swing once more at this uh, thing. Yes. <laughs> cool, cool. Do another hurt. Do a hurt. Oh. oh, yeah, that's a hit for sure. Yay, it hurt. We used to hurt. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's enough to hurt, but it's not enough to do him in. Uh, anything else, Minerva? That'll be the end of her turn. All right, next up is Rose. I have um, just just a question like about how you run the games. Is it possible to do non-lethal magic damage? Yeah, I think within reason. Okay. Like, like a fireball can't be non-lethal, but... Right, right, obviously. <laughs> but other things like, you know, psychic damage or uh, a firebolt or, or other magical things can be non-lethal if you are, are deft enough to do it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I usually... The way I usually think about it is, like, if you need to roll a saving throw, it's probably going to kill him. But if it's an attack... Um, so, she will come up here and non-lethally shocking grasp. Yeah, I think shocking grasp is a just because a, a great like non-lethal attack. Yes, it's nice to get a use out of that. Yeah, it's been very helpful so far in this encounter. <laughs> Amazing that damage. <laughs> nice. 
Uh, yeah, so that is enough to uh, not kill, but knock out. <laughs> <laughs> like, the guy is stunned, his eyes roll back, his hands clench. Uh, yeah, he is, for all intents and purposes, locked up. <laughs> cool. Anything else? And then I will put my body in between a civilian and a cultist. Cool. Yeah, so you, you shock this man, run away, jump over there. You're so nice. It's <laughs> weirding me out. <laughs> All right, this guy, uh, he is, yeah. he's still fighting Kid. Uh, he's gonna attempt to hit Kid. Miss. That's a miss. Next up we have Yarick, uh, coming out through the gate finally, having reached the end of our second round of combat. Uh, your turn, Yarick. Uh, yeah, I will continue running uh, forward. Uh, I can only get there with my movement. Uh, and then I will pull out another javelin and throw it at this cultist right in, directly in front of me. Okay, yeah. He having just reappeared from, from stealth. Have him in the face. <laughs> Oof. Uh, nope. Ooh, six. Yeah, not a hit there. Oh, that was, that was a natural one. Not I mean. what I meant. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the, uh... <laughs> <laughs> That's not what I meant. The spear clatters uh, to the ground. Yeah, hopefully no one was standing directly behind him. Uh, <laughs> and that's yeah. Clatters to the ground somewhere over there. Uh, breaks in half. Uh, yeah, that's essentially all I can do. Yeah, level one. Uh, not a lot of action economy here. Okay, this guy is dead. Uh, we come to the beginning of the turn order with the end. Uh, sorry, no, no. Actually, we have some guards. Uh, the guards are going to back up now that the situation is kind of under control. They're going to go more towards protecting the gate to stop people from coming through. Whereas uh, the Knights of the Hell Riders, uh, they're very active, so they're still up in the combat. But these guards, the, the Flaming Fist, they are going to throw spears, uh, do a little bit of damage here and there. The Hell Riders are going to step up with their greatsword, uh, and it's pain. It's just pain world. So they, uh, they finish off that guy, uh, and then we'll jump to Dien. <laughs> Not a lot I can do here. Uh, okay, I guess uh, for now I'm just gonna draw my sword, which I assume that's a free item inter object interaction. Okay, and I'm going to get. Ooh. Okay, I'm gonna use dash to run right up to the guy that Rose is next to. Uh, Rose and Jack. And, you know, I can't do anything, but, you know, I'm there, I'm ready. He's probably going to be dead by next turn, but hey, if he's not, then Moral support, uh, man. Moral support. Steal the kill. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, cool. So after that, it's this cultist. He is unconscious. Let's get him out of the turn order. So we go to Morgan. Uh, Morgan, it is your turn. I am personally annoyed that I'm so far away. I'm personally, like, to be a part of the whole live thing. Um, so let's just like answer if he wants to play more games. So yeah, so it is uh it is wrapping up, so maybe like it's calming. And then run forward anyway. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, I still don't that though. I'll need an adult to show me. Um I can go thirty feet, yeah. Yep, still thirty feet forward. <clears throat> okay. All right, I'm through the gate. Yeah, I wanna... Oh, that's it. Let's try to hit that guy who Rose won't kill. Try to steal the end kill. Hit her off. No! That's what I get. Yeah, eight's just not gonna be enough uh, to make contact there. Anything else? Okay. On this guy's turn, he's going to attempt to hit Jacques. Uh, but it's not enough. Uh, thank goodness for that shield. Thank wow. you, Rose. Rose. MVP You're welcome. right here. <laughs> MVP right here. Yeah, seriously, that, that shield of faith has gone through uh, four, six. Like, It's it's racked up some, some saving. I think you've saved him from a lot of damage. 
dead. Pick the right person. Yeah, you picked the right one. Good job. <laughs> Uh, but like his ally, unfortunately, after his turn, he is going to uh, use his Shroud Self ability uh, and disappear into the dust and shadows. <laughs> okay, after that, uh, the other one, the one who looks like him, who disappeared last turn, uh, he... He's going to look at his options, who to hit, and decide there are no good options. He would disengage, disappear, uh, and attempt to run away. So those of you who are nearby, uh, you hear the sounds of footsteps, and I'll, I'll just say, uh, Yarik, you do get attack of opportunity as he runs past you that you can't see, so it is a disadvantage. Uh, I would can love I to. see them if he can see them? Uh, no, no, so he's, he's truly invisible. Uh, if he passes you, I'll tell you that you can hear him. Uh, and you can see footsteps, so you can still make attacks. It's just a matter of, like, he's at disadvantage. <laughs> okay, yeah, so as he runs past, you do you hit him as he's in the square right there. Uh, dealing... Seven piercing. Seven piercing. Okay, not enough to kill him, but you do see some blood splatter on the ground there. Uh, and he's going to keep attempting to run past everybody, uh, but he, he runs into a... A, a crowd here. So I'm gonna try to skirt around them uh, and take up a position over here. Is it here? It is your turn. Um, is this one unconscious? You said. Yep, that's the one that's on the ground. Minerva standing over there, uh, unconscious. Body. Okay. I. Oh, there's then, one yeah, one there's there. one more way off over here. Way off. You know there's one fighting Jacques, but right isn't this If it's right at 80, does it go under disadvantage? No, if it's at 80, it's still within the range. Okay. I will take a very long shot. Uh, yeah, 21 is a definite hit okay. for four piercing. So as he's trying to bring the mace down into the back of uh, a kid, he you know, brings his arms up and then between his shoulder blades, his, his crossbow bolt sinks into his uh, one of those bones. Anything else in here? No, fine. Okay. Cool. You watch. With that, we'll go to uh, He's Dead, and right, we'll go to Jacques. Good. Jacques, you do know and you can see like footprints and sounds. He's just invisible, so you can't target him. I'm gonna like, kind of nod to Rose and be like, I respect the effort, and I'm gonna also do non lethal if I do end up hitting. Okay. Uh, but I am doing Booming Blade. Nice. Okay. Uh, roll to hit. Yeah, so 22 is. Yeah. Oh gosh, I'm like so good with damage, guys. I'm sorry. Definite hit there for uh, 6 piercing and 2 lightning. Okay, anything else? Um, no, that's gonna be it. Okay, cool. Uh, kid, you're still struggling with this one this one cultist. Uh, you know what? Let's, let's just light, light him on fire. Okay, yeah, good moment for some like rules lawyering. Uh, ranged spell attacks, or just ranged attacks in general, at melee range, do have disadvantage. Um, just kind of following the logic that to steady your aim while someone's threatening you actively would be kind of difficult. Uh, but 19 or 22, they're both a hit, so you just like point blank fire a firebolt uh, into his chest here. Kill it with fire. And you do indeed kill it with fire. Uh, can I, as a bonus action, this is completely useless, can I just like stomp on his dead body? Sure. Yeah, you can just use your movement to move up and down on his body. Sweet. <laughs> okay, as we near the very end of combat here, uh, Minerva, it is your turn. Currently, there are no visible enemies. Uh, they are both invisible at this point. What would you like to do? Minerva's just gonna stand guard at this unconscious... Uh... I can't remember what they're called. <laughs> Not Bane's, uh, the, the fist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's just gonna stand guard out. Make sure he, he's like stays. Okie dokie. Uh, Rose. 
You know what? We're just gonna. Because <laughs> I. For no reason other than I feel like it. We're gonna non lethally punch. <laughs> so. <laughs> 12. Yeah, 12 is not enough. So you don't know if you, like, maybe you did make contact. No! Maybe you, um, That's so close. Yeah, it was so close. You just you just <laughs> didn't make contact with him. Alright, that's my turn. That's it. <laughs> Alright, let's see. Uh, this guy's dead. Uh, Yarik. So, you you know there's one over here, uh, but you, you haven't seen him recently. And then you know one ran past you and you made contact. Uh, I'd like to move back towards the gate and attempt to detect the invisible person, if I can. Look. Yeah, go ahead and uh, roll, roll perception. Oh, natural one. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's not going to be good enough to detect him. Um, however, when you move there, uh, you can't move there because you run into him physically. Oh. <laughs> yeah, so you are uh, stopped short in your tracks there as you run into him, so you end up right here. Uh, you can't, still can't see him, but you know very well that he is right next to you because you've just clobbered into him uh, in your, your haste to get back to this position. However, because you used your perception, uh, sorry, used your action for perception, you don't have an action for an attack. Um, I do not. I but I will yell to the the people around me and say, "You four, there's a man right here," and I'll point him out. Attack. <laughs> yeah, and they'll spin around because again, at the end of the turn order, it's their turn. Uh, so they'll start to space out. This guy will run over. Uh, attempt to get to the position. The guards don't let him pass because he is still a Hell Rider. However, the two guards at the gate, uh, they'll both wheel around and will uh, poke spears at that space. All right, so they do a little damage uh, and then it is uh, Rhea's turn. I've forgotten to do anything with Rhea this whole turn, which is a shame, this whole encounter. Uh, this knight will step around, uh, is going to bring down the great sword on this target here, dealing uh, no damage. He missed. Okay, well, I know that there's someone right in front of me because Jack hit him, and I haven't. Seen him. So I'm just gonna take a swing at the guy with my sword. Cool, cool. Some of the commoners start running towards the gate here, uh, as as the guards aren't paying attention anymore. Moving while this wakes up. Yes, yeah, so this is where the benefit of that being invisible, uh, even in close combat, is super beneficial because you know he's there, you just can't manage to find his body with your weapon. This guy is incredibly lucky. Yeah, he's super lucky. He should be toast. <laughs> Okie doke. Uh, Next up is Morrigan. I just realized that I thought some things I could do, I can only do within five feet, but I can do them within 90. So, um, I've been drinking. That's my character's, um, yeah. <laughs> I can attest to her ability. Uh-huh, yeah. We, um, we were drinking and playing cards. Um, anyway, so I am going to do a thingy. To those That's how I lost my shirt. Ah, sorry. <laughs> Twice. I got tired of the, the having to click the button in the Discord music player, so I tried to do it on the jukebox and forgot to turn the volume down, so it's like super loud. <laughs> Are you okay? Was it just me? It's just <laughs> it's, it's just like they're yelling about losing a shirt and me saying I was drinking really loudly. It's accurate. <laughs> yeah, I am going to uh, cast Hex on him. I think for Hex you have to be able to see him. That? Uh, see yeah, that? it's in the description. Yeah, you have to see him. I was going to do a perception test. Uh, no, no. Even if you knew where he was, you wouldn't be able to, to use that because it says you'd place a cre uh, on a creature that you can see. What about those people? Okay. What about those people down there by me? 
So currently, the only visible people are allies. Uh, this man's invisible and that man's invisible. Um, there is one unconscious person. I guess you could hex the unconscious guy. Uh, but the only other people who are visible are, are refugees who are trying to get into the city or hell riders or um, the flaming fists. So only allies. But you could uh, you could hold your action and then when someone becomes invisible again, you could use your ag- your reaction to hit them. Yeah, I mean, that's what I meant to do. Right. <laughs> Absolutely. Perfect. Well, uh, on their turn... I knew how to use the character the entire time. I knew it. I, I believed in you. Okay, on their turn, uh, they become visible, which means you can then use your held action to use your reaction uh, to... A bad Yeah, cast Hex on this guy. So I'm going to find a... I'm just going to use this token stamp here. Okay. Then on this guy's turn, uh, he sees a couple people around him. Uh, I think he finds himself outnumbered. He... <laughs> seriously considers running away uh, but instead is going to beat up on Rose here. He's committed to the cause. One, one million percent. <laughs> Made of porcelain. Yeah, he definitely picked like the, the, the easiest to hit target, I think. Uh, and he rolled a 23 and a 12 for uh, 15, <laughs> 15 damage. Oh dear. Down. <laughs> she just down. Are you <laughs> Another like chip to her porcelain and just boom. I think this is the first time I haven't been the first one to go down. <laughs> <laughs> this is monumentous. Yeah, Malcolm pretty much is like a, a shoe in for the first dead, the first new character. <laughs> <laughs> but not today. Okay, and then this guy, uh, this guy's gonna try to run away. Uh, he, he has sown the chaos that he wants to sow, and he's going to try to get away here. Uh, that would give two of you attack as opportunity. Um, so he is going to try to run. Five, ten. Go ahead and, uh, Deanne, roll your attack of opportunity. Uh, nope. So that doesn't hit, so he's going to go... A little bit further. Okay, and then there's a bit of a technical problem here where my computer lost the feed uh, due to something unrelated. Uh, a notification popped up and took the feed down. However, um, there was a pretty cool combo and I didn't want to miss that. So what Jacques did was using his Warcaster, instead of casting, um, instead of casting, instead of using an attack, he used a cantrip as an attack. Part of that cantrip allowed him to deal Booming Blade because that is an, a cantrip that attacks with an attack. Uh, so he did Booming Blade. He also already had the Arcane Weapon on. So this this target took the Booming Blade, the Arcane Weapon, and then continued running, all for a total of like 17 to 19. Somewhere, it was a large amount of damage. So he ended up taking the enemy down uh, in an attack of opportunity, which was pretty cool. So shout out to you, Jacques. Uh, sorry, my computer missed the whole feed. This cultist is going to attempt to run away. Uh, that oh, is going wait. to give some people some attacks of opportunity, except he used the disengage action to try to get away from you folks. He can only get to here because he didn't dash. So Zaheer, it is your turn. Okay, is this 10 feet wide or is it 20? Yeah, so you're seeing the top-down view of like a palisade, so it's very wide, but the, the pathway okay. itself is only 10 feet wide, uh, and then like 30 feet. I will move, and as I do, pull out my shield and sword and uh, get a defensive position with uh, my arm reach, whatever it's called, because I can hit five feet farther. Okay. As you run past him, he's going to attempt to do an attack of opportunity. He misses. No, it does not. <laughs> but yeah, I, I just create a freaking wall that he has, he's not going to be able to get through. Okay. All right. So after Jacques, it is... Uh, sorry. After Zaheer, it is Jacques. Uh, your enemy haven't fallen. There's many dead around you. And for the most part, combat has cleared around you. Though I guess Rose is down, so that's important. Uh, I am gone. I have no time to pick it. Alright. Still being very slow. I'm gonna mine silver him. 
Uh, mine's liver. Oh, really? Mine's liver. I'm gonna. I did too, sure? and then I was told by one of my players, it was like, no, it's mine silver. Like, no way. No, no, no. <laughs> your, your friends are lying. Oh. It's mine slipper. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I might have spelled it wrong. This is definitely a Mandela effect. Then. <laughs> I might have spelled it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Mandela effect. You just, you just broke my mind for a moment. <laughs> yeah, I've been pretty confident, but the, you, you broke Thank me. Thank you. <laughs> All right, so mine sliver. Might have, actually, it might have been autocorrect. Oh yeah, yeah, it could. I might okay. have even spelled it wrong. You actually. know what? I'm just gonna go with mine silver forever. No, 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 I'm not. That, that, I'm, no. Oh <laughs> no! I like it. Yeah, you silver a piece oh. of their mind. Give his brain heavy metal poisoning or something. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, you now have silver poisoning in your brain. Oh my god. Yeah, it's like the opposite of Kintsugi, or however you say that. Oh yeah, yeah, the same thing that's on uh, uh, Rose, except this time it's on your brain. It's on the fishes of your brain. Yeah, I'm just gonna scout. What do you think you're going? <laughs> yes. Uh, and then that saving throw he makes um, for a round. He's gonna he's gonna take three psychic damage. And then D4 subtraction for that saving throw. Cool. Whoops. Okay. Uh, I'm just going to put this on because I don't have a better token for that right now. Um, oh, sorry. I was going to move a little bit. Um, oh, I'm sorry. My bad. No, go ahead. Go ahead. And I'm just going to kind of... Oh, wait. No, I'm not. I'm not, I'm not going to do that. I'm sorry. I'm going to move over uh, and start... I know it's a minute casting, but I'm going to start casting Mending on... Uh, Rose is a humanoid for all intents and purposes for healing. Uh, so, Mending won't really do much. We've been very sad. Kid, your turn. Um, is there... I know I'm pretty far away from the gate. So, like, is there a way you could, like, kind of sneak into the city amongst all the chaos? Yeah, uh, the guards backed up to the door, so they are they are doing their best to prevent people from coming in amidst the chaos. But it's not impossible. You could like dip around like the the cultists did to go around them, or like Yarik was looking to do. Um, again, also there is a pathway to the north, but to go over like the walls itself, I mean, it's a, a super tall wall, uh, well guarded. There are guards on top. Uh, if you're going to do it now, would be the time. Yeah. Well, let's get closer for sure. I don't know how close we'll make it in one turn. Okay. Uh, well, you can get 30 feet without dashing. So you can get to here without dashing. Uh, if you want to spend your action dashing, you can get to here. On top of this All right, let's go up there. <laughs> Stop on their, that body, too. <laughs> All right, Minerva, you're up. <laughs> All right, and again, the combat is almost ended. There's only one person left, and they're they're like, kind of headed off here. But how do we how do we unarrive? You can that you was, can you can do like that was going to be my question. Cast, um, an action to do a medicine check to stabilize if you don't have healing. That was going to be my question. With Rose being a warforge. Does lay on hands not affect that? It works. Yeah, it works. Okay, so uh, more forged are human, no, okay. humans for all 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 magical purposes, except for breathing, um, other some thing of theater stuff. But I mean, that would mean that I'm a construct and mending heals me, so there's some give and take. Yeah, no, that is not yeah. the case. It is definitely uh, we don't want to be healing you <laughs> one square foot at a time with a mending spell, <laughs> though it would be free. I <laughs> uh, no. Rose is a human for healing purposes. All Warforged can be healed with magical with healing. That, with that being said, that's that's an action, yes? It is an action, yes. A medicine check is an action. And okay. is not guaranteed then to I work. would like to... My apologies, fellow civilian. I would like <laughs> to... <laughs> 
Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I'd like to move move over to Rose. And Minerva would like to perform a lay on hand. Nice, another class reveal here. Uh, so you, you tell us, what does your lay on hands look like as you channel this paladin energy into Rose? Out of assumption to first timing myself on lay on hands, I would assume maybe her hands would have like this greenish bluish mixture like glow as she just pl places it like on her chest I would presume or where the wound may be okay um, <laughs> just More um, <laughs> yeah nice okay so you've got this healing energy that radiates out of you oh you could do more yeah isn't it only level one yeah, at level one, you get five, five points. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I, well, yeah, I have five charges, but I didn't know I could use more than just one, though. That's no, no, no. So those charges are are uh, representative of a pool of hit points that you have available to you. You can use yeah, as but many. you only get one per level. No, you get five, five points. Per so level. at a level one, you can only do five. Yeah. At From, a level two, you can do. You do one, two, five. Correct. You can do one, two, three, four, or five. At level two, you can do ever any number up to ten. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. I yeah. see what you mean. You but, but I'm saying I got five charges. Like, it looks like I have five total. Like, I'm guessing you're saying I can only use... Think of it like... Out of two, five? Yeah, think of those charges. They're not what? charges. That's your pool of available hit points. You can use as many or as little as you want at one time. Right. But okay. I can or theoretically or use or... two charges right now. Um, I, yeah. I think I yeah. see what the I think I see what the misunderstanding is. Those aren't charges. That's the number of hit points in the pool. So those aren't That's individual charges of lay on hands. Those are five hit points worth of lay on hands. Correct. Uh, you can. It takes an action to use lay on hands, and when you use it, you decide how many hit points you're going to use. That could be one or sixty, however many you have available. Okay. So I. So I. But I can use several of these. Yeah. Okay. So, okay, then I would like to use two of these to restore ten. No, it'd be, no, no. It'd be uh, two. So it, it's a. Go ahead. Okay, so this is one through five. Like I can choose up to. Okay, I see what you're getting at. Okay, All then right, I would cool. use. I would like to use five. <laughs> five. Okay. So, Rose, so that would take the entirety of that. Gotcha. Correct. Okay. That's your whole lay on hands until your next. <laughs> okay. Rest. I see now. Yes. Cool. All right, Rose. You're brought back. Uh, okay. <gasps> Pass her body to make sure she's actually alive. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Power on. <laughs> we hear the windows start up tone. <laughs> I love it. I'll use half my movement to stand back up and then the rest to get over here. And I'm just going to like I know he's unconscious, but I'm just gonna kind of like tend to the wounds to make sure that he's not gonna bleed out while he's lying there. Okay, yeah, you're, like, you're not going to heal him, you're just doing the you know, general stabilization for him. Okay. Mm -hmm. Kind of thematically, you know. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, after Rose, it is Yarick. Uh, again, one person uh, Yeah, I'll be chasing down the guy who ran through the gate. Uh, so I will move there, and then I will make it a, a, another spear attack against him. Eight. Yeah, you just can't seem to find a way to put the pointy end in him. <laughs> okay, at the end of the turn order, uh, these two guards are going to focus on trying to get people out of the city who are currently in. They're going to come up behind Morrigan and the, the, the uh, cultist here. This guard is going to attempt to take a spear through him. Uh, nope. This knight, uh, the Hell Riders, they're going to ride up here. Again, this, this Hell Rider stops... Uh, politely for the the flaming fist, but this one gets around and is going to bring down the great sword of death onto this guy. Uh, nope, just two damage. Okay, uh, Rhea will slowly uh, begin walking up to have a discussion with the guard. So we go to Morrigan. I do stuff. Uh, yes, stuff and things. It's my turn. Oh yeah. But 
I'm kind of annoyed that we're still fighting, so I'm like, uh, actually, you and a little more sober. So, <laughs> like, um, that dude is trying to sneak in. I'm gonna use Eldritch Blast. Uh, I don't you know actually... Oh, wait, wait, Deanne, I'm sorry. Yeah, that... Yeah, what? Yeah, no, no problem. Okay, yeah, it's actually Deanne's turn. I'm sorry, I, I skipped right, uh, that. Yeah, You're so... a person, and you can do so. Yeah, okay, so, um, seeing how... Deanne, in one case, exploded, but also seeing how they have displayed an ability to become invisible, I'm gonna fire off, and since they're all, you know, cultists to very bad gods that I'm aware of, I'm gonna fire off Divine Sense, just, you know, make sure there's nothing else around, and I am going to move back to, uh, the gentleman over here who has my spear lodged in his spine, and I'm just gonna pull that out. <laughs> Okay, I popped Divine Sense in here so I could read it. Uh, undead Fiend, Celestial. Awesome. Okay. Um, let me message you a whisper. I don't normally do whispers, but let me whisper you a thing. Because you would know not only their, that they are here, you would know their location, right? Uh, yes, until the end of your next turn, you know they're looking of any big thing celestial 60 feet. Okay, cool. Yeah, then I'm going to whisper you a thing. Uh, you don't have to do anything. It's just going to pop up in the chat so you can see it, but nobody else will be able to. I feel like somebody's about to be exposed. <laughs> Noted. <laughs> uh, well, um, unfortunately, now that I'm... I am truly, truly sorry about this, Sparrow. I'm gonna point my spear at Kid and go, watch him, you know, don't let him into the city. He, you know, he might be with him. You know, I've seen that he's helping us, but at the same time... Beans are tricky. They're not above stabbing each other in the back to further their own ends. Bitch. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know you. You're just a random joke guy that's been smacking. Can I bite him? <laughs> um, I mean, yeah. I would not get both. No. It wouldn't get through his armor, probably, but you, uh, you could try. <laughs> New record. Yeah, that's a new record, a, a PvP record. All right, uh, Morrigan, almost done. I promise. Murder, death, kill. That dude. That's right. Yeah. Isn't it kiss, marry, kill? No, is it though? Is it? I mean, I guess. I guess the D and D version is murder, death, kill. Mm -hmm. murder, murder, death, death kill. Um, I would like to be within five feet of them, and, okay, cool, cool, that's fine. Um, how do the action things work, like, um, I had a crossbow out before, like, if I wanted to switch my weapon, does that count as an attack or something? Uh, no, so every character can change weapons once per turn. Uh, they can attack, they have a bonus okay. action, they have movement, and if they don't take a weapon out, they have a free action for an item. Hooray! Alright, I would like to please um, I'm gonna switch to my, my, my crossbow out and get out, get out my sickle, because it's cool to look in. And then... And they're hexed, right? Mm-hmm. And then I'm going to use Eldritch Blast on that dude, though. Because we're still fighting, and I'm over it. Yeah, okay, I mentioned this before. Uh, ranged attacks at point blank have disadvantage, uh, so that one won't hit. Well, it does, though. So. Oh. No. Oh, well, why didn't you just say so? Yeah, okay. It hits and he dies. Uh, campaign over. 
<laughs> why, I, why didn't you say so originally? We don't need to roll, just tell me when it hits. Okay, this guy, uh, he's freaked out. No. Don't I, do I get a follow-up attack, though? He's going to try to turn invisible. When he mm -hmm. leaves, yes, mm -hmm. you'll have attack of opportunity because you changed to a melee weapon. But I have an argument. My argument is, if that two bro is within five feet of me, can I hit him with my tail? Yeah, tail, sickle, whatever. Because you have a melee, you're allowed to make an attack of opportunity. If you only had your crossbow out, you wouldn't be allowed to. Cool, cool. So between the two of you, as he tries to run away, uh, it's difficult to see him, but you manage to drop him right here as he's running away. Uh, he is felled and drops to the floor. Combat. Hard, over. finally. All right, with the combat decided, the Flaming Fists try to reestablish some semblance of order here, keeping those out, out, and those in, in. Uh, but they kind of look at your group, uh, thankful that you've saved them from, from, you know, just straight up murder. And they turn a blind eye as you guys kind of like uh, shuffle into the city, not, not in a hurry, but with purpose. I think the Hell Riders would come out and make sure that they went with Rhea because they're not going to leave her alone. I'm picking up the cultist and like slinging him over my shoulder. I am, you know, <laughs> locked on kid pointing my spear at him, you know, he might, you know, I don't know fully if he's an ally or not, because, you know, I saw him fighting on our side, but at the same time, fiends do be tricky. Can I book it for the or, gate before it's like completely? Yeah, you can definitely try. Yeah, so uh, Kid starts running, makes a mad dash. Uh, I know that, that Deanne said they were watching them, but Deanne was a little bit farther away. Uh, does anybody else try to stop this, this goat that was helping you but has been accused of being a fiend now by Deanne? <laughs> Unconscious, not I'm dead. dead. Oh. <laughs> 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 I'm, uh, you know, as kid takes off, I'm gonna take, I'm gonna chase after him again, shouting, you know, stop him, don't let him into the city, that sort of thing. I'm going to grab kid if he gets by. Uh, so between the two of you, uh, it's just a contested. Um, I'm gonna yell roll at the, uh, you know, that like somehow invincible young-looking kid with the teddy bear. <laughs> yeah. And tell him to get inside because he's me. <laughs> hey, you. <laughs> the other one's named Kid, but like Jocks is the kid. Like, <laughs> too many kids. Hey, Teddy Boy. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, and I'll like see all the commotion and like all the different types of people. I'll look at Rose as I'm going and kind of nudge her to follow. She will. Stay back and try and guide as many civilians in as possible. Okay, yeah. I'll kind of wake up. And I mentioned this during the combat that as soon as like there's a clear path, many of them would have taken off for safety inside the city. Some of them previously before the fight started ran off into the refugee camp and they can't be seen. It's not like you can track them down without spending at least like 10, 15, 20 minutes doing so. But in the immediate, you could definitely shepherd this crowd into the city. And the guards, like I said, they were, they're trying to stop this, but they also recognize the help that they received from you. Uh, and they're acknowledging like, okay, it looks like they took care of most of the cultists. Uh, we just need to reestablish order. And the best way to do that is to get this crowd out of here. So the guards are kind of helping too, like just push all these people into the city and as soon as they get there it's like roaches when you lift the rug or ants when you you knock the hill down they go everywhere <laughs> and here comes rose carrying the cultist who uh you know was was put unconscious during the combat uh but you are carrying them like a sack of potatoes in through the guards i will search the body in front of me. I know it has at least one of my crossbow bolts in it. You snatch that. My insight check kid um, 
kind of trying to get a gist of their intentions. For, for all I know, they're probably just a satyr um, from my personal experience. So I don't really see anything wrong with them. But if people are saying they're like a kind of fiend, I'm kind of confused by that. Um, Go on an investigation, Thomas. For, for picking pockets of the dead? No, you're fine. Goat. <laughs> <laughs> you want an investigation? No, re- if you're picking the pockets of a dead person, they're not moving. You're not pressured for time. Nope. You're just like literally put your hand in this pocket, put your hand in that pocket. Uh, no. Uh, and then Jacques, yeah, you 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 get the feeling that this is a satyr, but there's something hellish about them uh, because you do have like extensive travel experience in the Toothsome Emporium in different planes. I think you pick up on the fact that there's something off about the satyr. It's not like the satyrs you've seen before. It's not like it's not like the fiends you've seen before either. It's some kind of twist between the two. And then as you hear, you find a note that says bathhouse. Doesn't have anything else on it, just bathhouse. I know exactly what this note means. Uh, you also find uh, some coins. Uh, I didn't write down what it was I gave you in this, uh, and this is post, so... Sorry, everybody. I don't know what was left there. Um, I'll look. Uh, the material components to cast sanctuary, which would be a small silver mirror. Did you show me the note? I, I haven't yet. I mean, you're you're probably watching me though. You know I was just means. hearing. I mean, maybe I speak infernal. I might be able to know what it says. A hand. Yeah, so it's not written in like a different language. It's written in symbols and sigils and like shorthand. The only word that's identifiable is bathhouse, mm-hmm. but the rest of it's like thieves can't. Um, it's written in some coded. You know, there's a square that says rob this house. There's a triangle that says there's police over there. Uh, <clears throat> It's not like a different language. It's like it's written in code. Uh, so you could try to spend a long time trying to decipher it, but without the decipher like code or without the language that they're using, without the, the, the shapeology, it would be near impossible. You'd need to find someone from the organization to translate it for you. Gotcha. Okay, so we're left with a uh, kid trying to escape Deanne, being accused of being a fiend. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Uh, we're left with the Hell Riders trying to get in, the Flaming Fist being, I don't know if nice is the right word, but they're being permissive, allowing the refugees and you lot to go in, though they are intending to shut the gate down very soon. And then going back again for, for Jacques, um, you have traveled to multiple planes. You've traveled to most more places than most people have been. Um, just because the the capability of the Toothsome Emporium, so you pick up on a lot of things about Kid. Um, they they have certain things that are Feywild about them, but it's like uh, something is perverting those features. Something is uh, killing off the the fancy fairy light. Something is stopping the growths from growing on them to turn them into like a, an ashy sort of substance. Um, they they probably are a fiend but they probably are not in the Infernal Army. Well, with that kind of insight, I feel like I would just be like, they're a chaotic creature, so I'd be like that. They're just from the, probably the Feywild. I don't think they'd be any kind of fiendish, just a satyr. Uh, I walk up to one of the guards uh, around Kid, and I tell him, uh, go get the commander. Bring him here. He'll sort this out for now. I'll take up your post. And I think for two guards who have been like posted here for too long, they're they take a, a dismiss very easily. They're like, "Oh yeah, you got it. Okay, we'll go get the captain." Uh, they run off. <laughs> and I continue uh, to try to run in. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, it's just a, a contested struggle. So if you want to, you know, force your way in, uh, it's just a matter of like escaping the grasp or trying to push your way through. Yeah, I'll try to check. Just, like full on, sure. just full speed. Ready to ram my head into something. <laughs> okay. Full speed ahead, mother truckers. <laughs> I'll, I'll try to grab him if he makes a run for it. Yeah, I, I would Fucking as well running. if he gets past Deanne. 
Okay, I think with the overwhelming number of people who are like committed to stopping Kid from getting away, uh, we could roll, but it's gonna be, it, it's gonna be um, tedious. So instead, we'll just we'll narrate that Kid gets stopped by the collective effort. Sure, let's try. If I run into them, I fucking hit them. <laughs> okay, yeah, we can roll. We can roll. Oh, uh-huh. it's just athletics. Uh, I think Kid can roll if it's just like a grapple check. Kid could roll athletics or acrobatics. You're right. To evade yeah. it, kid can do acrobatics or athletics. To make a grapple, you have to do athletics. So just let's have that contested uh, roll. I can do acrobatics or athletics? Yeah, because you're just like... Okay, let's do that. ...wriggling out of a grip. Okay. Uh, yeah, that's convincing. Uh, you're grabbed by a number of people before you can get away. And then behind that whole... Uh, event, we have Rose carrying the dead body over her shoulder. Uh, not like a trophy. <laughs> She's very delicate with the body. It's like, yeah. <laughs> Don't want to hurt the body. <laughs> no, exactly. Right, like, like, I wasn't told to kill it, so I'll just take this person with me. <laughs> There's a, a small whisper from Rhea and, and the other Hell Rider as they, like, you know, whistle or, or grunt at Minerva. Uh, and they they book it into the city. She will take that cue and continue. <laughs> so she will follow. Okay, yeah. So the three of them uh, go to. Uh, I think they would they would have had a contact in the city that they were supposed to reach when they got there that could help them um, get you know established. Uh, they obviously have to be a little bit more stealthy now that the the flaming fist are trying to arrest them. Um, so they I think they would like go down farther into the city than find a, a tavern to get into. Um, or some place to get room and board, uh, but mostly just be out of the street. Uh, uh, well, Yorick sent some guys to get the captain to uh, sort all this out, so I'm gonna, you know, drag Kid into the city and just keep him there for this, you know, captain too, because, you know, I don't have any authority in this city. I'm not the law here. I'm gonna let them sort it out. I will weigh in, though, you know, because... On one hand, I know he's a fiend. On the other hand, he helped us. On the other hand, fiends are tricky, so, you know. He may not be evil, is what I'm saying. I'm not entirely certain on him. Yeah, so we just see post-conflict that uh, Deanne and Zaheer are taking a uh, kid in by the horns, uh, like leading a ram through a, a, a stable or something. Um, you get into the... the courtyard there's like this opening where business is done or where people have like um small send-off parties for patrols and things like that uh and you wait patiently for captain zodge of the flaming fist and you don't have to wait very long uh as he was brought very promptly by the other flaming fist guards that uh yarik sent and uh, when he arrives he's this gruff man um very authoritative looks at you all uh walks up and says I think he. I think he first looks at the 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 cultist over your shoulder, uh, and then looks for a human to speak to, and goes like, "Okay, uh, no." Um, looks at Zier. No. Looks at Morgan. No. Like he's he's taken aback. He doesn't have a human to speak to. It's not that he's racist. It's that that's who he's been trained that his people are humans. So he should st- speak to the flaming fist and the other you know people like the flaming fist. It's a bit racist to be honest. Um, so he just looks at the group and says, what are you going to do with that? And I think as you speak, the, it settles in that like, oh, this isn't a human I'm speaking to, I'm speaking to a construct. And then he'll turn to address somebody else. Uh, I don't understand. You came here for refuge. You came with that party. And then you helped us with the cultists and I appreciate it. Uh, but then you saved one. I don't, I, to what end? Are you going to, question them, turn them in, kill them, follow them. Do you have something against the cultists? Listen, I won't I won't look a, a gift in the mouth. I'm thankful to have you. I just need to know who I'm working with and what you want out of this. Let's start with this. What are you going to do with that prisoner? Hmm. Well, if I am a prisoner, but if you can heal him, I'd uh, gladly give him over. You want me to heal a cultist? <laughs> I, I mean, I have the means. I just have never heard anybody who wants to heal one of the dead three. <laughs> 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 
Right. Well, and he'll turn to one of his his like other you know generals, and he says like, "Go get Tarek. Uh, no, not Tarek. Uh, his brother, uh, Derek the cleric. Uh, break. Oh, Jesus. What? Yeah. This is the moment where I realized that I invented Tarek and Derek the cleric and the non cleric. So, uh, open mouth, insert foot. Okay. Uh, so he brings he brings his cleric, uh, and it takes a little time. I'm personally going to go kind of like wander further back from the whole questioning thing, but I still want to be able to see. Okay, so you kind of like get off of the immediate attention, but somewhere close by where you can still hear what's going on. Okay, so he brings by this, yeah. this he brings his cleric by, um, and they'll give a modicum of healing to this guy, uh, a moat of healing, and they'll they'll bring him back to just a little bit to where he can answer questions. But as soon as he wakes up, he's like lashing at people, trying to bite people. Uh, I'll be reporting to Commander Zod, just telling him uh, how many cultists there were, uh, how we dealt with them, and letting him know that some of these refugees made it into the city. Uh, but several of them helped us fight, and we're confident we killed all of the, all of the, all of the cultists that were there. Right. I forgot that I asked you guys before, uh, before the cult, before the cleric got here. Uh, what did you want to do in this instance? Um, so Yarik was reporting, and Morgan kind of crept off before the cleric got there. We already saw that Minerva and Rhea already kind of broke off into the other direction. Uh, and if I'm not mistaken, I think that uh, Captain Zodge actually asked you guys about the cults of the Dead Three and said, "Listen, I'm not really keen on asking for help, but." I do have a problem in the city. There's an, an uptake, uh, an uptick in in violent crimes. They see the the cultists of Bane, Ball, and Merkel have been going around, uh, just killing in the name of their gods, and it's been gruesome. It's been very terrible, uh, and we are at our wits' end, where we have very limited resources, and now we have all these refugees that you've helped into the city, and I don't blame you for that, but it is problematic for me that I don't have enough resources to keep the city safe as it is, let alone with all these extra folks. So I need your help. If you're willing, I'll give you 200 gold coins through the lot of you, not each. Uh, I remember that you guys, like, uh, try to hear specifically kept saying each, and I kept saying no, uh, and I'm sure that'll come up here in a second. Uh, essentially, he enlisted you and deputized you that you were allowed to kill any cultists you see on site. Uh, if if you confirm that they are I'm indeed cultists. <laughs> I was going to yeah. ask him, I'll pay him there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so he'll share. It's worth 200 gold pieces. Uh, and then if you can turn in any Hell Riders, he's willing to give 50 pieces per Hell Rider you turn in. Uh, 50 gold pieces. So there's like a bounty on them as well. Uh, you can call me whatever you'd like. Yeah. <laughs> 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 about that pay yeah yeah so Zodge here shared that they could get their payment if they submitted uh, evidence of the dead three being you know eradicated per writer thank you I agree per, per person yes yeah and this is where uh, Zaheer tried to bargain and I kept saying no uh, there's some really good role play in here uh, no, per, per. And it's a shame. Per person, we're worth it. It's a shame that I missed it, because uh, there was some really good ping ponging going back and forth between the two characters, uh, between the group and I, between. Um, I'll take your job. <laughs> like someone doesn't want the people, I'm just gonna say it. <laughs> Aren't these Hell Riders important to you? It looks like someone doesn't really want them. I don't want them. I just need them to be somewhere out of the area where I know that they aren't affecting Baldur's Gate the way they did El Torel. I mean... Baldur's Gate is they ride in hell? Right? Their name. <laughs> for crying out loud. Like we ride. They're called the Hell Riders. And you don't think it's convenient that their city has fallen into a sinkhole? 
listen, I don't trust them. I don't want them in my city. We're not going to kill them, but we will lock them up or ask them to leave. They are not welcome here. I do not want their problems to be my problems. Derek the Cleric. And this is where Derek the Cleric arrived, uh, and he revived the cultist of Bane, and they did some questioning, and then I think they terrified the cultist, uh, where the, t- the cultist just would, like, nod, shake, nod, shake, uh, and in the end, uh, they did kill the cultist. So, spoiler alert. What's the pay for that? <laughs> Yeah, it's just holding on. Do I get a badge? Yes, we can give you a badge from from commissions. How will people know we're a deputy then? Until you have a badge, don't worry about if they know. You won't be arrested if you're working. Give them my name. (laughs) Do I get to meet every one of your guards then? This place also holding up the goat kid. Yeah, so he then looks over to uh, the, the knight in shining armor holding up the goat and starts to ask a question is like I assume okay I assume you're going to handle that and you're not going to make it my problem keep in mind Zodj doesn't know that this goat is uh, is in front of that all happened outside before he arrived what happens if they accidentally die will we still get paid can we? <laughs> Do I get to bring in your hero's crew? Yeah. I'll bring, like, a trinket. Yeah, so I think here they're asking about how are they supposed to show that the cultists were killed, um, and Zodj doesn't care. He just wants the, the cultists gone. He's not paying for ears. He's paying for the problem to be resolved. So he wants them to find the source of it, find which noble family they're tied to, uh, source it out, and then come back with the problem solved. He did give them uh, a, a, a start. Are there others that we need to know about, or just us? Uh, he mentioned that they should go speak to... Well, how do we know who they are? Uh, he mentioned they should go speak to Tarina at the Elf Song Tavern. Uh, she's not a good person by any means, but she's a spy, and she has, she has some good intel. Uh, and she owes Zodge a favor, most of all, which is which is important. Um, so he says, go speak to Tarina, give her my name, she'll help you find a place to start the investigation. Um, and then, you know, they're supposed to go and, and do that. Do they have food there? <laughs> is there booze? <laughs> yes, there's food and booze. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a tavern. <laughs> At this moment, there no game. <laughs> your sister's choice. It's, fun. <laughs> it's more fun when you yell. <laughs> okay, so uh, a bit of clarification. Zahir picked up Kid, and now he and Morgan are walking off to the tavern. Mm-hmm. Dragging the kid that's trying to bite Without it. Without knowing it's- where I'm actually going. With confidence, I'm walking. Yeah, she We're kind hungry. of like looks back and forth between the group and the captain a few times before kind of like just like going, ah, and then just going off to follow Kid and Sahir and Morgan. Mm-hmm. He's the Let's captain. Go to learn. The captain has um, lost a bit of her confidence with uh, how quickly you've been. Th- he's been thrown for a loop by you two. Rose is going to follow and just look around and just continue to look around as she follows, seemingly not a care in the world. Um. Oh, I was going to say, Rose, we need to find that dude. What dude? Um, so, Saladin? Saladin? What's their name? At the cavern? Karina at the cavern. Arena. Okay, thank you. I'm trying to write that down. <laughs> write that down, write that down. Mm-hmm. 
At this point, uh, the captain pulled Yarik aside, uh, and I don't remember the full details of the conversation, so I apologize for that, but I do remember that the captain said, look, they're in the city now. We need to make sure that they are uh, law-abiding. Um, remember, murder is not allowed. Um, so th- I will be holding you accountable for their actions. I'm putting you on you know, reserve. Take a few days off. Go follow them. Follow through on this, this investigation. I can't have you... Uh, Distracted with your normal guard duties, we'll fill in. It's fine. Uh, and then he offered Zahir, not Zahir. He offered Yarik an extra two hundred gold. So he gave two hundred gold to the whole party, and then two hundred gold to Yarik specifically, if he was able to um, suss out the noble family and then come back to Zaj and share the information with Zaj, so that Zaj could turn it in uh, and look like he solved the problem. So I understand. I'm very thankful, Zaj. When you arrive at the Elf Song Tavern, uh, it is this, this happening place. There's a lot of things going on. Uh, I think the first people who arrive there are Minerva, Rhea, and the two Hellrider knights who uh, got through the gate and then dispersed into the city. And they're brought their, uh, their contact in the city that was supposed to help them find a place to hide. Uh, takes them into the back, like, cellar, um, under one street. You speak so... Oh, that's right. Uh, the first thing I described in the Elf Song Tavern was a song that was happening in the Elf Song. Um, there is a uh, there is a ghostly voice that appears and sings. However, it's an Elven, so as soon as we have another character speak Elven, they couldn't hear the song, um, even though it is uh, one of the kind of like neat little Easter eggs in the, th- in the adventure. Okay, so Minerva, Rhea, and the two other Hell Rider Knights arrive. They they are brought like in one building under an underground, um, you know, service tunnel, into a cellar, uh, and then uh, quickly stuffed into a side booth. Uh, and the the proprietor, his name is Alan Alith, uh, is frustrated with them for doing so. And he's like, "M, you got to stop bringing people here. I can't keep harboring them. I can't keep hiding them." Bartender. Yes. Uh, so, <clears throat> bartender. Morgan walked in, went straight to the bartender. Here, I need a drink. Order drinks. <laughs> uh, got a couple for the whole table, I think. Bartender, you really did. <clears throat> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I know Zahir ordered food. This part is going to be a little bit hazy and piecing together a lot of song uh, and dance. That there's a lot of gaps where I was narrating I the scene. I want to try and get a game of dice going and see if anyone wants to join. <laughs> so uh, Zahir, Yarik, and Jacques sat down at the table while Deanne and Minerva went to the bar. Uh, sorry, <laughs> Deanne and Morgan. Uh, and Minerva was kind of hidden over in the corner. Kid was at the table for a while, but then began to sneak around the tavern. Uh, and eventually, <laughs> Morgan w- wound her way up to the proprietor and luck. asked him about yes. uh, a person by the name of Tarina. I pull out the dice. And... Yeah, Morgan? Uh, Morgan. Just going to go up to the party. <laughs> Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna stick with Morgan. I'm gonna take a seat with her, but I'm gonna t- so that this way I'm facing the bar and the entrance. You know, make sure I can kind of keep my eye on what's going on. Make sure if anyone suspicious comes in, I can clock them or make sure nobody tries to come up to me and try anything. Is everyone with us inside the bar? I'm gonna join the bard and just play alongside him. <laughs> They're digging a sad song and making it happy. A sad song, a, a, a somber song, doesn't necessarily have to be sad if it's played the right way. We have kids here, right? And we have kids with us. Kids at the table with, with, to here, I think. Yeah. I think at this point I would have I would have put down kid <laughs> if, if we can't carry him around and not trust him all the time. So, he can make his own choices. Can I teach you how to play dice? <laughs> <laughs> uh, on the tables. Is there anything on the tables other than the dice? I mean, there's always like leftover alcohol or like partially eaten food. Is that like napkins. Yeah, yeah, that too. I'm gonna eat the napkins. <laughs> okay. <laughs> It's like dirty cloth napkins. Uh, it's not paper napkins. Extra flavor. 
There you go. <laughs> Nothing like a little extra, you know, grease and gravy. Are you hungry? <laughs> I'm just gonna like intensely munch on napkins. I pull out a, a ration and slide it over to him. A what? A ration, like oh. dried food. Like a big Devour. <laughs> um, I will the can hole. <laughs> I will sit down and I'll say to Zahir, I'll say, We're playing, and I'll put Tinky on the table and he'll kind of like Tinky will kind of like sit up and grab some or uh, well, they're playing dice and he'll just like roll some dice Tinky, Tinky will not your key I'm, I'm gonna kind of eye the teddy bear like maybe that's edible too no <laughs> listen if you want something to eat I'll, I'll give I'll give uh, I'll give kid a uh, uh, fuck a bar devour swallow <laughs> 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 oh. I would like I would like to Morgan would like to um get a couple mugs of ale from the bartender. And okay, one for Diane. Diane and myself. And then for those four over at the round table. And I want to ask the bartender if they know a dream. I can't drink. <laughs> I'll take yours then. Okay, that's fine. I'm a big guy. So towards the end here, it becomes exceedingly difficult to piece this together. Uh, there's really no there's too big of gaps of narration between um should i roll a persuasion so i'm going to do my best to fill in the spaces but a lot of this is going to be i want him to give me information yeah a lot of this is going to be really hard um to follow so i apologize to my players and i apologize to anybody who's watching but i'm going to leave it here as is so you can at least piece the pieces together yourself maybe oh um you know i just think she's really pretty. <laughs> the really important details that we have to pick up as an audience here uh, from this episode specifically is that Tarina is upstairs. Uh, the bartender basically gives Morgan permission to go up there uh, and says, don't wreck my bar. It's really important for me that you don't wreck my bar. Um, but go up there, do whatever your business is with Tarina uh, and be good about it. Uh, halfway through, as Morgan is preparing to go up there, there's a commotion outside as uh, some brigands, some ruffians uh, are come demanding uh, to the bar. <laughs> we we know Perfect. she's in there. We know they're in there. We know that you're harboring them. I'm um, trying to paint kind of the dichotomy between, or like, rather the, the, the double veil confusion. Is he referring to the hell riders that are hiding there? Is he referring to Tarina? Um, so some of the group went and listened to that and some of the group started to go upstairs. Meanwhile, Minerva uh, was talking to Ray Amantamort, who's like, we need to stay hidden. We can't get found. Uh, so that's kind of the main. <laughs> what do you got to eat here? <laughs> I just yell over the crowd. Yeah, that's kind of the main stuff that we need to pick up as an audience here. Um, and I then like it. We set the stage for next time where Remember the whole table. Some of the group is investigating the noise outside. <laughs> some of the group is about to go upstairs uh, and some of the group is staying at their tables. I order for the entire table. I don't think I put in my cash money. Mm -hmm. I, say, yeah, I, don't, I don't know if we started with any of that. Your background should give you some. Don't. Somewhere between five and ten. Don't rob Rose. Oh, oh, okay. <laughs> I have enough of that in real life. <laughs> Not enough pylons. Opens <laughs> <laughs> the her pouch to put in a piece of gold. She doesn't like know to hide it. There's a fair amount of gold in her pouch, like a very sizable amount. <laughs> um, and then she's looking around. Oh, this is what I was designed to do. I'm used to it. 
Right. So in this section, uh, Alan Aleth. Rose. The proprietor speaks to Rose about her performance. That's my name. And is trying to like find out who she is. That's what I've been called. Where she's from, what she's called, what her stage name Rose. is. Rose. <laughs> <laughs> because she played an amazing performance. Uh, and he offers that she can play. I don't. I don't drink, but I appreciate the room. She can play anytime she wants. I'll take the drink. And she can have <laughs> any drink while she's there. Uh, she is an amazing performer, according to this guy. That sounds good to me. And kind of wants to book her like as a regular to perform here because the people who are in here right now are drinking more, ordering more food. Uh, they're doing a bigger... You know, they're doing bigger business because she's playing so well. So he, of course, wants to accommodate that. He'll give her a room and a drink. Um, obviously, he's not going to serve all of her friends, but she can have a limited drink uh, and she can have a limited room while she agrees to perform here. Uh, Deanne is going to lean over to Morgan and ask, in an, uh, now that we know where Tarina is, you want me to come? Should I stand here and keep watch? Um, I can't decide if I need backup. I probably should go alone. All right, you're the one with the Just to check it out. All right, I'll keep an eye down here. Come up and get you if it looks like things are going bad. Purely playing. Uh, it's all she knows how to do in this situation. I'm going to go upstairs and I'm trying to decide if I'm going to tell anyone. Uh, now that I'm I'm close to this door here and I've that argument going on outside, I kind of want to peek out and get a better idea of who's arguing, what's what they're arguing about. Aw, he's so cute. Not that ugly. Um, yeah, so I, I kind of hear a little lot of commotion, and I notice it's kind of bothering um, the sheeple, so I kind of uh, tell Tinky, I'm like, roll for me, and I'll go, I'm going to go check it out. Yeah, I'm just, you know, keeping an eye on the bar, but after, while I do that, there was one thing I meant to ask about earlier that I forgot. Uh, the Hell Riders, have I heard of them before outside of what the captain was saying, or? This part's important for me to cover and clarify. So I shared with Jacques that the Hell Riders have a different reputation in most places, but every reputation is positive. Um, there's one well-known story about the Hell Riders where an angel came down, um, a Solar specifically, came down and enlisted many of s some citizens out of Elturel and said, you will come into hell with me and we will kill a bunch of devils uh, and then we'll come back. But this is going to turn the tide. We're going to end the end the, the devils because they're terrible. And if we can, we'll end the demons while we're at it. Um, they became known as the Hell Riders because they literally rode into a a, um, a a cave pathway that went down between the earth into different uh, into the into the hells. They rode through the gates of hell, uh, and they rode through Avernus with this solar, uh, and just kicked the crud out of all the devils and demons that were there. Uh, they came back and they were gifted this celestial star that drives evil away from it. Um, it was funny because they were actually in the middle of a vampire uh, like epidemic and the star drove all the vampires out. So the Elturel has been the pinnacle of good for the longest time and the Hell Riders are believed to be the reason Elturel is so good that um, and the gift that they were given. But the gift was given because of the Hell Riders. So Zaj having a problem with the Hell Riders is suspicious. Um, is probably xenophobic because he's like, no, I don't want the, the people, if something bad happened to somebody, they probably deserved it. I don't want them to make that happen to me. So uh, Jacques definitely would hear that hell buyers are good and for the most part considered good by all people. Um, I definitely wanted to clarify that before we end the episode here. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I just wanted to check, see if I knew anything beyond that. Like I said, just watching might glance over to the curtain a couple times, but I don't give it any special attention. Definitely give kids special attention just in case he tries anything because shifty devil goat guy. <laughs> you know, other than that, 
not gonna lie, half of my brain is going, I should eat the curtain. And half of my brain's like, I'm gonna follow her upstairs. <laughs> gonna like try to sneak, be stealthy, gonna sneak 100. Minerva just is going off of what uh, Reyes saying, just keeping quiet. <laughs> just keeping it down though. Yep. All right, we did it. Uh, that's session one. Again, I apologize for this coming in post-production, folks. We have had one session since this one was recorded. Uh, we made sure our microphones were working. We made sure that the audio feeds were there. There shouldn't be anywhere near as many technical interruptions on that production as there were on this one. Um, there were a few, to be honest, but not as many. So I greatly appreciate my players. Uh, thank you guys for joining us. Thank you for being patient with the character creation, the two different Discord channels. Uh, we really appreciate all that you guys are doing. Uh, if there is anybody out there who's watching this, please click that Discord link, jump in the channel, let us know who you are, where you're watching from, um, what you think of the stream, what you want to see differently. Uh, this is something that we're all pretty excited about. Uh, but again, it's just good D&D, a good group, uh, and frankly, it's just really exciting to be a part of something that's kind of pushing our boundaries. So thank you each and every one of you. And I hope we see you next time on Your Turn to Roll Presents Descent into Avernus. <laughs>